Dr. Rup Kumar, and many distinguished scientists and panelists participating in this special session on the eve of the inauguration of International Parts of Monsoon, the seventh edition. I, on behalf of all the organizing institutes and organizing committee, extend a warm welcome to all the participants, distinguished delegates, distinguished institutes, and the panelists present here for their active contribution, significant cooperation for organization of this international workshop. As all of us know that the entire world was passing through a very difficult time because of the COVID-19. And IWM7 was also a victim of this pandemic. As it was earlier planned to be organized last year, but due to this threat, we could not organize. And finally, we tried our best to have the physical presence of the distinguished scientists across the globe in New Delhi. But that could not be possible because of this continuous threat. And finally, we decided that we'll go for a virtual conference with active participation. But I'm really happy to note that there has been overall response from the researchers, scientists, operational forecasters across the globe from different continents towards this workshop. There are about 200 presentations, invited oral, short, short oral and post presentations on various aspects of monsoon. As Dr. Potnaik was telling, monsoon is life for many countries in this world, especially when you consider the South Asia and Southeast Asia. Considering India, about 70 to 90 percent of the total annual rainfall is realized during the monsoon season in different parts of the country. And therefore, the, all the activities in the country are oriented towards monsoon. All the festivals, all the special occasions, the community activities, all are oriented from early ages towards the monsoon. And analysis of monsoon or observance of monsoon is not new in India. Even starting from the Vedic ages, you can find out the mention of the importance of rainfall in Rig Veda, written 3000 BC. Followed by, you can find out the mention and discussions, qualitative analysis in Sam Veda and Yajur Veda. In Athra Veda, you can find out the quantification of the measurements of rainfall. And followed by that, you can find the mention in various Upanishads, including Brihat Sangita where it is written, Aditya, Dayati, Vristi. The emblem of India Meteorological Department is taken from this Sanskrit person from the Bihat Sangita, Aditya, Dayati, Vristi, the sun creates rain. So it, it indicates the importance of monsoon and rainfall and the realization by the people in the early ages. And people tried their best to detect it, monitor it, and also try to predict it. Followed up on that, there has been many development worldwide. But considering Indian system in the medieval era, also we came up with the measuring systems by the people like Chanakya for measurement of rainfall. And the basic principle adopted by him is still valid at present when you consider a cylindrical instrument for measurement of rainfall. However, at that time, he tried to measure the volume of water. Now we are measuring the depth of water. So like that, we came off towards the instrumental edge. In the instrumental edge, all of us know that the British India took the lead for monitoring of monsoon, starting with Dr. Walker, 
to the MDG of IMD. He tried along with the team to identify the parameters influencing monsoon. And finally, in the beginning of 1900, we started to provide some kind of long range forecast based on the information available at that time. At that time, the British India could help to understand the science and define the water circulations and many other physical parameters. The Southern Indian Oscillation identifications and many more was followed up. And in the latest time, you will find that with the global intervention across the various countries, there has been integrated approach by the globe to understand, monitor, predict, and provide the forecast of monsoon in all spatial and temporal scales. So in that way, we have come up a long way as a global community. There has been various developments, starting with the simple weather forecast based on synoptic meteorology, to now statistical, dynamical statistical, the numerical weather predictions, and now probabilistic numerical weather predictions, not only in short to medium range scale, but also now cross scale, and extent range forecast, and seasonal forecast. We have come up with a multi-model ensemble schemes at present for predicting the monthly and seasonal rainfall during monsoon in different parts of South Asia. So while doing so, India has played a significant role by providing the forecast and warning services to the, all the countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Middle East with respect to monsoon. And also it has acted as a regional climate center to provide the climate forecast and advisories to all these countries. We've also come up with the capacity building program regularly, which has helped the operational forecasters and the researchers to sharpen their knowledge and plan the activities for further research in monsoon and development of application products. We have moved from simple forecast towards the impact-based forecast. And we have introduced the impact-based forecast not only in short range, but also medium range, and now fast and extended range. It is helping the people as over the years, the forecast accuracy has improved. The impact is forecast is making, becoming a useful hand by the, all the stakeholders, users, and the disaster managers. So while going through the various sessions as planned in IWM7, I find that it is equally distributed addressing all the components, and I am hopeful we all will enjoy from learning from the giants in the field of monsoon. And this workshop will inspire and invigorate the young minds across the globe for benefit of knowledge and for the research. So thank you very much. I once again welcome Dr. Chang, Dr. Tyagi, all the distinguished guests and panelists to this August session of International Workshop on Monsoon 7th edition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your interesting thought about the workshop. And that is also, that will set the tone for this, our five days workshop. And we'll be having a very fruitful discussion throughout the session. So now may I now request Dr. Ajit Tyagi to kindly give his, remarks. He's associated with this workshop from the beginning and actually he's a co-chair of the Internal Scientist Committee, Scientific Committee of this IWM7. So now over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik. Uh, on behalf of, uh, would you put my presentation on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, on we are sharing your PPT. Yes. On behalf of International Scientific Committee, I extend a warm welcome to all the online participants to this workshop and convey greetings on World Water Day. Monsoon is synonymous with the rains uh, in tropics and subtropics and closely associated with economic well being of the large population of this region. Indian International Monsoon Workshop, I'll be giving a broad overview. The background big picture has been given by Dr. Mahapatra already, 
so specific to this workshop, I will be covering the overview for the benefit of the participants who are attending online and may not be aware of the background of this workshop. So start starting with the background. International workshop on monsoon is a forum as brought out by Dr. Mahapatra for researchers and forecasters to discuss recent advances and current issues covering all time scales, starting from mesoscale to the climate that are relevant to the forecasters of high impact weather in the monsoon region of the around the world and also applications for the societal benefits to the society. Next slide. Next. So it is an effective means to transfer the new knowledge and science and technology to the national meteorological and hydrological services in the monsoon region through a training workshop. So uh, the training use is, is an important component of this uh, international workshop monsoons and this used to be uh, one of the side events uh, along with the main workshop. And this year, because of the COVID, uh, it was separated. And we had uh, earlier, as I'll bring it out, a very effective uh, training workshop on the S2S. Next slide, please. So, International Workshop on Monsoon is a major quadri and workshop series of the W under the World Weather Research Program. It is organized by the Working Group on Tropical Meteorological Research with the co sponsorships with across the WWRP and the World Climate Programs. So it, it is it is a, a collective uh, partnerships of uh, WWRP and the World Climate Program, along with uh, the National Meteorological Service, the, which is, is the host of, in this case, the India Meteorological Department. Next. So this is the street. It started way back in 1997. The first IWM was held in Densap, Denspasar, Bali in Indonesia, followed by a workshop which was held in New Delhi, almost on the similar days, 23rd to 26 March of 2000, followed by a third workshop at Hongzhou, China, next in 2004. The next uh, uh, workshop, also two workshops were held in China first, uh, the fourth one in Beijing in 2008, followed by Macau and Hong Kong in 2013. And the last workshop was held at Singapore from 13th to 17th November 2017. Next slide. So this particular workshop, IWM7, was planned to be held in India at the invitation of the government of India uh, from 12th to 8th to 12th March initially in 2021. But as brought out uh, because of the COVID, it was postponed that we wanted to have this as a physical workshop to 2022. But because of uncertainty associated with uh, the COVID, this is uh, turning out to uh, uh, an online workshop, but the response as brought out by Dr. Mahapatra has been overwhelming. Next. So these are the broad thematic areas. It covers all aspects related to monsoon science and, and its impact and also uh, the societal benefits. So it covers the regional monsoons, which in today's session will be covered by eminent experts. Uh, Subseasonal to seasonal predictions, which is assuming great importance modeling of monsoon processes, climate change, and the monsoon. There is two sessions which will cover these aspects. High impact monsoon weather, floods and droughts, field experiments and observation campaigns, monsoon prediction for societal benefits and new technologies. Next. So as brought out, this is the key activity of the WGTMR and overseen by the the committee co-chaired by the Professor Wang Zhuo and Professor Yukari with support from uh, active consultation of Dr. Mahapatra, who is the DG and the PR of India, and support from the WMOS, WWRP Secretariat, uh, Estel, and also co-chair of the International Scientific Committee of WWRP, Chris Davis. 
So it has been excellent teamwork and it was overseen by uh, International Organizing Committee chaired by uh, Honorable Secretary Dr. M. Ravi Chandran MOS, who has extended full support and also consisted members representing international scientific programs and national meteorological and hydrological societies in all monsoon regions. The International Organizing Committee was assisted by the International Scientific Committee, co-chaired by Professor Chen and self, and uh, it played a key role in identifying these keynote speakers. And we are happy to say that we had received a full cooperation from all eminent meteorologists, and uh, 38 invited speakers will be presenting papers on various themes uh, during this workshop. Uh, apart from this, the the spread work has been done by the National Organizing Committee and Local Organizing Committee uh, under the directions of the Director General of Meteorology, Dr. Mahapatra, and the coordinator, Dr. Patnaik, assisted by the Director of IITM and also the International Meteorological uh, Project Office, Dr. Rukumar Kohli and Dr. Susmita Joseph. So it had been an excellent teamwork. Uh, and uh, we are happy that uh, it is culminating into a very well planned and organized uh, this international workshop despite of all the challenges of course by the covid next next so uh, seven three key companies uh, one as i brought out the training used to be the very important part and this year uh, because of the covid we couldn't have a physical training but as, uh, as a, I think a good outcome of this had been that we had a very elaborate uh, training workshop of spreading over 10 days uh, in the, from 1st to 12th November um, on S2S training workshop. It had both training, uh, online training as well as practical sessions. So this has been a great success. Then the main workshop, which is now on from today onwards, uh, spending over five days. And it will be followed by a special issue of Mosam. Next. So, some highlights of the International S2S training workshop. Um, it, it's been an important component as brought out by of this uh, international workshop on monsoons. It was organized at, at, from 1st to 12th November, and more than 100 registration of participants took. Um, parts, participated in this from the uh, mainly from the national meteorological and hydrological services and also from the academic institutions around the world. And another very practical aspect of this was that a pre workshop orientation program was uh, offered to the training workshop to familiarize with the, the, the various tools and the data requirements and the software to be installed. And uh, the IITM and the IMTO played a Key supporting role in the successful organization of this workshop. Uh, the, the proceedings and the lectures are available on the YouTube as well as the IITM and IMTO uh, websites. Next. Uh, we had a very good response uh, from uh, participants across the globe uh, covering all the thematic areas and um, the local organizing committee has brought out a abstract booklet which will be released tomorrow by the Secretary in the main inaugural function, and it is also available online uh, on, on the IWM website. Next. So, uh, a, a brief overview of these uh, technical workshop. It was challenged to organize this workshop, the timing, especially because of the different time zones. So, we initially were planned from 23rd to 26th March. But because of a um, good number of invited speakers, we had advanced this to 22nd March. And today we have got six invited talks uh, by the eminent ecologists covering the regional monsoons. So the morning sessions will be from 03 to 06 UTC um, uh, and evening from 12.30 to 15, 15 UTC to accommodate all invited speakers and the audience part. There are 38 invited talks, six today, and another in eight sessions for each invited talks will be there from 20 uh, to 26 March. There will be 72 oral presentations and 68 short oral composted presentations planned in various. The oral presentations will be in uh, parallel sessions 
uh, taking place you know, in both morning and the evening sessions. Next. So this is uh, uh, the breakdown, uh, 22nd March, six invited talks, 23rd to 26th, we'll have a morning and evening sessions for invited talks in each session. Invited talks will be for 15 minutes duration, followed by four, four minutes of question and answer session. Next. For oral presentations, um, there will be in six sessions, so two pa parallel sessions in Hall A and Hall B. Uh, four sessions will be held from 23rd to 26th March in the uh, morning sessions and two evening sessions on 24th and 25th of March. To see, encourage uh, young researchers, uh, oral presentations, short oral presentations has been planned for the poster presentations. So they will present their posters and, and will be presenting the salient features of their posters in two to two and a half minutes in these sessions. Next. So this is a broad overview, tempact, but very well planned by the local organizing committee in, in consultations. We used to have a weekly training tech, technical program committee reviews uh, chaired by Professor Yukari. So this had been a good exercise and we were able to accommodate timings of all the invited speakers and other speakers uh, in a very, very uh, amicable way. So this is what is there and it also gives the linkages to various sessions. Next. So one of the achievements which I'm sure um, Professor Cheng is going to cover is the achievements of earlier IWMA has, has been associated with very closely and spearheading the international workshop for monsoons where the research publications peer reviewed booklet series, global monsoon systems, and also the BAMS papers which were brought out out of these uh, workshops. And in similar lines, uh, this workshop will have a special issue of Partly General of Meteorology and Hydrology, for Geophysics and Paul Mossum. And uh, these uh, will, it will have a peer reviewed process uh, duly done. Uh, and we invite, uh, have already sent requests to all invited speakers to submit their papers. So we hopefully will have a very good quality journal. Uh, as the outcome of this publication. So with these opening remarks um, about the broad overview of the this particular workshop, I, I once again thank the host country, the DGM, the Secretary Ministry of Arts Sciences, providing full support and also the guidance from the WGTMR co-chairs, Professor Wang Zhou and the Yukari to make this happen and wish this uh, workshop great success. Thank you, Jai Thank you very much, sir, for nicely summarizing the IWM activity from beginning and how planning, we are doing all the planning and overview of the what expected means we are bring also planning to bring out a special issue. Thank you very much, sir. So now may I request uh, Professor C.P. Chang for, gi for giving his uh, opening remarks and just uh, to say about him, he is he the chair of he was the chair of IWM for one, two, three, or sorry, one, three, four, five, six. So I think you are, you are the stalwart in this IWM. So, so it is your kind words will be very helpful for all the viewers. Okay, thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be able to, uh, to join this meeting here. Uh, Professor Tiati just give a uh, history of all the IWM. I'll just add a few uh, remarks. Uh, uh, but first, I wish to make a personal remark that I first visited uh, New Delhi, India back in December 1977. So that's almost 45 years. <laughs> Another five years will be half a century. Uh, I have observed all the big changes, small changes over those near half a century. Uh, so it's for me, uh, at one time I was familiar somewhat with the street of New Delhi, such that uh, if a taxi driver wants to take me around, I will be able to catch him. <laughs> uh, I can no longer say that. Uh, anyhow, uh, I've been involved uh, with IWM since uh, the first one. 
uh, the reason I was involved in the first one, uh, that what occurred in, uh, I believe, 1997, 1996 or 1997, can't quite remember, in uh, Bali, Indonesia. And the meeting was organized by the M1 committee. At that time, that was M1 was for East Asia, Mansong. Uh, M1 committee, Professor Ding Yihui and uh, his team in Beijing. But for some reason, uh, in the, they couldn't get a visa to go to Indonesia until the last day, so I end up having to be the temporary chair. The second meeting, uh, IWM2, was actually in New Delhi. Uh, it was held uh, a week after a monsoon climate meeting. I remember many scientists uh, was confused, so that nearly all the scientists went there for one week and left before IWM2 opened. Uh, but anyhow, so IWM2 was basically a training workshop. And I started getting uh, formally uh, requested to uh, start on IWM3 in Hangzhou, China. Uh, but the first three IWM were organized when the working group of tropical meteorological research was part of the Tropical Meteorology Research Program. And after that, uh, the Tropical Meteorology Research Program was uh, disbanded. And so the working group was merged into the World Weather Research Program. The first three IWM was uh, heavily on climate, but starting uh, <clears throat> IWM 4, uh, we are now part of the World Weather Research Program. So it took a lot of adjustment. And at that time, we decided that we must cooperate and collaborate with the WCRP colleagues. Uh, so we had a huge meeting in Beijing 2008, right after the Olympic. Uh, <clears throat> from that point on, it was always uh, uh, deep cooperation, close cooperation uh, with the, our WCRP Monsoon colleagues. We hold meetings basically during the same week. Uh, and then starting, I think, 2013, after the one year Macau, uh, we were told that uh, WWRP should uh, increase cooperation with WCRP. And we, we got this instruction say, we have to talk to our WCRP colleague, make sure we join everything together. And I told the chairman of the WWRP Joint Science Committee, he said, we've been doing that for all these years. We never not cooperate with them. Anyhow, so now, uh, last, I think a few weeks ago, uh, WCRP and WWRP jointly establish or help establish this uh, international monsoon project office uh, in India. And I think that really is a great development. And I call that the center of the monsoon universe now. It's both WCRP and WWRP and every all the activities being done in the country, India, where monsoon is most, most important. So this is the development I wish to just uh, mention that. And we always, the IWM always are in personal meetings and I think uh, many people enjoy that mode. We have close collaboration between climate and weather scientists, between forecasters and researchers and so forth. And so unfortunately we can't do that this year, but I hope we'll be able to do it uh, next time. And finally, I would say, I'd like to mention that one half of the invited speakers are familiar names and faces. Uh, we thank you very much for continued support. Uh, spend your time and energy to contribute to this uh, series of workshop. Thank you.
Now I'm done. And so is this going to be the last one of the welcome remark session? Dr. Pantanet, I think he's busy. Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm all done. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much, sir. Actually, yeah. as you have given overview also of idolment. Sure. With this, I thank all the, our three panelists for giving brief introduction about the IM IWM workshop and also the challenges. So thank you, Mahapata sir, thank you, Tagi sir, and thank you, Professor Chang sir. So now with this, we conclude our the opening remarks part. And now we'll start the actually the technical session. So now we have a very distinguished uh, uh, scientist and uh, monsoon scientist to chair this session, Dr. Uh, Rupo Kumar, Dr. Rupo Kumar Kohli, sir. And uh, actually it doesn't need much introduction. Many people are aware of him. He has uh, contributed a lot to this uh, WWRP, WCRP, Cliver program, monsoon, S2S, then SASCOP, the South Asian Climate Outlook Forum, for many things. So, yeah, if you see his biodata, he has contributed a lot, particularly for this uh, monsoon related uh, activity. And uh, he was also the chair of this executive uh, director of the IMPO, that is the International Monsoon Project Office in IATM from 2019 to 2021. And uh, during recently, in February, that period uh, launched office, uh, officially. And still, he is providing all valuable guidance to IATM. And Dr. Kohli has served as a chief, chief of World Climate Application and Survey Division at WMO Secretariat in Geneva for 13 years and made significant contribution to the development of regional climate centers and regional and national climate outlook forums, which are recognized to be the key operational elements of the global framework for climate survey. So, this is a very great achievement. And in introduce also now with these lines, we are also starting our the national climate um, forecast services and uh, then vice chair of WMO standing committee on climate service member vulnerability impact adaptation and climate service advisory board for CMIP, etc dr kohli has earlier work at itm from 1982 to 2006 and was the head of climatology and hydrometeorology division he co-authors a book with the late professor gb pant on climate of south asia published by john Welly in 1997 publisher then he was also the lead author of ipcc fourth assessment report published in 2007 dr kohli is a life member of fellow and, and fellow of indian mass society so over to you sir now to kindly conduct the session thank you sir thank you very much dr patnaik uh, and thank you for that introduction uh, we, and I consider it uh, a great privilege and honor uh, to be given the opportunity to chair the first session of this very important workshop on the monsoons. Uh, the, uh, this session uh, actually uh, deals with regional monsoons. But as we know, monsoons, while they have uh, many common features around the world. In, in fact, we, we, we even have the concept of global monsoons, but their basic manifestation is at the regional level with their own unique uh, features. So I think this session is, is very important, the inaugural scientific session. Uh, and we also uh, are fortunate to have very eminent speakers with uh, lifetime achievements uh, to their credit uh, to share their some of course, we will not be able to cover comprehensively all the regional aspects, but at the same time, I think we will have uh, a, a glimpse of the tremendous work that has gone into understanding and predicting the regional monsoons. Uh, we have about we have six uh, speakers in this session. Uh, we have about 140 minutes for this with a short break in between. Uh, there is a slight change in the program because of uh, some uh, unavoidable circumstances. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra will be uh, giving the talk uh, uh, in the second slot. Uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Richard uh, Johnson and then Dr. Mahapatra and then we'll have a break and then the, fall, the remaining four will be after the break. Uh, so we, with that, uh, I think we can get started. Each I, I understand all the speakers have already 
uh, uploaded their presentation. So the organizers will be sharing uh, the presentations online and, and will be changing the slides uh, as per the instructions of the speakers. We have about uh, 20 minutes for each presentation. Uh, and I request all the speakers to uh, conclude uh, in 15 minutes so that we have four to five minutes for uh, discussion. We have uh, uh, almost 40 uh, people online for interactive session uh, while the sessions are being live streamed on the YouTube. Uh, so without uh, further uh, delay, I, I now invite uh, Dr. Richard Johnson. Uh, who is uh, a professor emeritus uh, in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences in the in Colorado State University? Uh, he will be speaking about a potential world city generation by West African Square Lines. Uh, Dr. Dr. Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the invitation to speak at IWM 7. Um, my uh, slides uh, have a lot of animations in them, so I'll have to say next <laughs> if, if someone can troll a, a number of times uh, uh, since I won't be sharing my screen. So uh, if you can, uh, and, and there's something uh, there's something on top that's covering up, maybe uh, there. Okay, um, so we've done work on, uh, Indian monsoon over the years, the Asian monsoon and North American monsoon, but most recently we've gotten interest in the uh, West African monsoon, summer monsoon. So this talk um, deals with that. And uh, to begin with, I'll say something uh, in the way of overview. Uh, this first slide shows um, West Africa, the conditions that exist there during the summer monsoon with very moist air to the south over West Africa and then the, over the Sahara we have hot, dry uh, Saharan heat low. Uh, that, and this con uh, condition leads to the upward mixing of a lot of dust and, uh, and creates a Saharan air layer that extends out over the Atlantic and, and can even affect tropical cyclone development. Uh, the upper panel in this uh, is a cross section uh, that goes from 20, uh, the equator to 20 north showing uh, the vertical structure of the layers and in the north you have the Saharan air layer. If you go to the next, uh, please, uh, I, can someone go to next, please? There. So you have a hot, dry Saharan air layer uh, north, mixing up uh, to 600 or 700, even as high as uh, five, the mid troposphere, 500 hectopascals. Hectopascal, and uh, to the south of there, uh, next please, um, there's a African easterly jet that uh, resides uh, between 10 and 15 north typically. So convection uh, is exists to the south of the Saharan air layer and there's an intrusion of moisture to the north uh, impinging upon this dry um, uh, Saharan air. And um, there's an African easterly jet that has disturbances moving along it which are Afri African easterly waves. Next. So these African easterly waves are, are developed as a result of barotropic and baroclinic and instability associated with the, uh, this jet. And uh, there's a strong north-south temperature gradient. Uh, and uh, also convective lady heating plays an important role in these uh, Afri African easterly waves that develop. Next. About 60% of the tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic evolve from the, these African easterly waves. So they're important to understand how convection interacts with these disturbances. Next. Here, here's a uh, depiction of uh, created by uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Lefort of uh, typical squall line over um, West Africa, the leading convective line in a trailing stratiform region uh, moving toward the west, and uh, this uh, structure actually resembles that found in many other areas of the tropics. Next. So what we've done is to take uh, data from the 2006 AMA campaign over West Africa, and this is a uh, map of the network from that region, and 
This field campaign was designed to improve understanding of the West African monsoon, uh, both monitoring of the monsoon and prediction. So here we have to the north the Sahara Desert. The colors are the topography over the region. And um, be, uh, south of the Saharan Desert, we have the Sahel region. Well, um, a number of the stations indicated there are operational sounding sites. And uh, if, in the next, please, um, there are two sounding networks that were set, uh, set up there, uh, so, some with additional sites added, but not someone using existing sites. And uh, these are form a basis for our study. And the next, there's a, a MIT uh, Doppler radar was at, uh, located at Niami which sampled these squall lines that move through the region. So that's the focus of the study. Look at these squall lines connected with these African easterly waves. Next. Whoa, okay. So, so that network, we developed a gridded data set uh, from that, uh, all those soundings, um, a one degree by one degree gridded data set, 25 hectopascal vertical resolution, uh, to study the characteristics of these way, uh, disturbances that move through the region. So this is a time series here of the onset of the West African monsoon um, that goes from uh, June 1st to the end of uh, September, equator to 20 north. And these are averages of the uh, daily trim rainfall in the 500 millibar vertical motion field between zero and seven east. So this uh, encompasses the most dense area of soundings. And one can see we, we have a region, if you can uh, uh, click uh, next, please. Um, one can see that up uh, through the month of June till the first week in July, most of the convection was confined to five north or south. But then uh, after the first week in July, convection jumped northward for several months. And uh, we call this uh, first period the pre-monsoon, the second, the monsoon period. So we'll look at both of those periods. Next. These are, uh, these are uh, PPI images of two uh, squall lines that moved to the region, one on 19 July and the other on 11 August. This is during the monsoon period. And most of the squall lines were of this nature, north-south oriented a convective lines with a trailing stratiform region moving off to the west at an average speed of 17 meters per second. Uh, squall line uh, convective lines were uh, narrow, of course, uh, maybe 20 kilometers wide, but the uh, stratiform regions were very extensive, several hundred kilometers. So the analyses that we carried out are able to sample the vertical motion field that's divergent in vertical motion fields in the stratiform region, but not the convective line region. Next. So let's look at the changes um, following monsoon onset. If we, uh, yeah, this is an earlier version of this one. And on the left panel here, we have the pre-monsoon period. And if you look on the lower, you can see the uh, lower plot, you see the rainfall uh, peaks just south of five north. But after the monsoon sets in, you see the rain shifts to the north. And in the upper panels uh, in color are the, um, apparent heat source and uh, uh, in color and the, and the vertical motion field in contours. And you can see that after the monsoon sets in, the heating uh, ascends, the heat peaks ascends and strengthens and shifts to the north consistent with the rainfall shifting to the north. Next. Uh, this this uh, two panels show the pre-monsoon and monsoon periods, uh, zonal wind and absolute vorticity. If you click on the next, there will be an arrow which pops up. It shows this African easterly jet around uh, between six and 700 hectopascals. Um, and then uh, the next, af after the monsoon uh, sets in, this jet shifts to the north. Um, and uh, you can see in the color there, there uh, that's the uh, absolute vorticity field shown in color. And there's a reversal in the gradient of uh, the absolute vorticity, which is a necessary condition for barotropic instability. These are now averages over a long period of time. So in the mean, then, there's this uh, uh, 
reversal in the uh, absolute vorticity gradient. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> now, these plots uh, show the potential vorticity field uh, pre monsoon and monsoon. So, uh, next, there should be an arrow there that shows um, the colors are the potential vorticity field, and there are also contours on those. Uh, we also put the rainfall in the lower panels. Uh, so prior to the monsoon, you can see there's a tongue of high PV that extends uh, from 20 north southward to um, 5 to 10 north from uh, mid-latitudes or, or the subtropics. This high PV is associated with the deep convective boundary layers over the Sahara that raise a lot of dust, and you get convective heating that... Uh, there's an enhanced stability at the top of this deep adiabatic layer, which leads to these high values of PV, which are extruded into the into toward the tropics. Next um, arrow, and uh, the PV field. If you look at the north-south uh, gradient of, of this uh, PV field, there, the stippling shows where there's reversals, and this uh, this goes back to where uh, Bob Burpee shows that this. Is, indicates there's, uh, therefore, possible barotropic baroclinic instability of the zonal flow um, in this region associated with uh, the African um, easterly jet. Next. So what we've done is to take a composite of, of these squall lines following the monsoon onset, and we've used uh, a work of Nieto Ferreira, um, who studied uh, nearly two dozen cases and so we've created a composite of 12 cases here. And if we look at the lower axis, there's time relative to the passage. So time zero is when the convective line passes. Negative times are before line passage and positive times are, uh, uh, positive values are times after passage. Basically, we can't uh, sample the convective line structure, but we are sampling here the stratiform characteristics that are following uh, the line passage. Next. So what you see here is the, um, after the line squalling moves by, you see warming aloft uh, and then also warming uh, in, atop the boundary layer associated with the mesoscale downdraft in the stratiform region. Next. And um, this next one shows, uh, this is a specific humidity anomaly field. You can see uh, moistening in the upper levels and drying at low levels associated with the mesoscale saturated downdraft. And the next, uh, this uh, lower plot shows the relative humidity anomaly showing, uh, actually, uh, this is the uh, total anomaly field, uh, a total relative humidity field. And you can see very moist conditions near in the upper troposphere near the stratosphere associated with the leading anvil, as well as the moist conditions uh, connected with the stratiform region. Next. Okay, now here's continue with the composite. Uh, if you click on the next, uh, the upper panel here shows the vertical motion field. And in the stratiform region, there's upward motion aloft and downward motion below. Next. This is the apparent heat source field. You can see strong heating in the stratiform region, and then there's uh, less heating at low levels, in fact, even uh, cooling in, in the stratiform areas in some locations. But there's a strong vertical gradient in the heating near the melting level, which is indicated by that uh, dashed line. Uh, this strong vertical gradient in the heating is due to the cooling um, from melting that exists. And that strong vertical gradient in heating uh, rate is important in creating potential vorticity, as we'll see in a moment here. The lower panel is the uh, next is the um, parent moisture sink, which shows uh, large values in the stratiform region. Next. So uh, we've taken uh, out of those 12, we looked at the uh, seven northerly tracks of uh, squallings, of those that track just south of the, uh, the African easterly jet, which resides around 15 north. So on the cyclonic shear side of that jet, uh, we've taken seven northerly track squall, the strongest, and put them together in this composite. So if you go to next, 
these are total fields now. You can see there's divergence aloft in the stratiform region, and then there's convergence near the melting level. Next. The absolute vorticity field, there's an anticyclone aloft and cyclonic uh, absolute vorticity uh, near the melting level. And next, this is the PV, this is a total PV field. You can see uh, between a four and 500 hectopascals uh, ahead of the convective line, there's high PV, and this is associated with that tongue of PV that extends southward from um, uh, the Sahara region. But you can see it gets amplified and deepened following the squalline passage. So uh, there's something going on with this squalline that amplifies the potential vorticity field in the mid troposphere. Next. Uh, this is an, another figure that shows the uh, composite structure for the seven early track cases. But these cases, in this case, uh, we show the anomaly fields. Next. Um, there's uh, a, a vorticity maximum anomaly near the level of the Af African easterly jet around 700 uh, millibars. And uh, this is uh, uh, on the cyclonic side of the African leaf easterly jet. So basically, as the uh, squalling moves by, there's a circulation that uh, intense comes in that sort of intensifies, um, amplifies the vorticity several, uh, say, six to 12 hours after squalling passage. Next. This is a lapse rate anomaly. Basically, the high values here mean increased stability. So where there's melting, it enhance, there's an enhanced layer of stability in this region. Next. And um, this is a PV anomaly map. There's an upper level, uh, or at least uh, uh, around 400 to 500 HPA, there's a positive PV anomaly, and this is connected with the heating over the Sahara. Next. And a little bit lower, uh, residing near the uh, melting level, which is indicated by the dashed line, that's zero degrees C, there's a PV maximum that shows up there connected with the melting. So we have sort of two sources of PV coming into the picture here. Next. So, this, we put together in a summary here uh, a, a sequence of, of slides uh, going from 24 hours on the top to 24 hours, uh, 24 hours before to 24 hours after squalling passage at Niami. So on the left side there, there's a uh, uh, PV anomaly uh, field is shown in color at 700 HPA, as well as the circulation anomalies and the uh, sounding arrays are shown with the star indicating Niami. And in the green uh, segment is the uh, schematic squall that's approaching the region. Uh, it's not always that structure, but it's shown for, for reference. And uh, next. You can see there as uh, squalling moves past the uh, ra MIT radar site, there's a circulation center to its south. Uh, and that's uh, at around 700 level, and it moves off toward the west following that squall uh, system. Next. This uh, second row of, uh, of uh, panels is the, uh, the flow at 600 HPA. The melting level is at around this, near this level. It's actually 575 HPA. So this is near the melting level. And you can see this, uh, the structure uh, with PV is different this time. As you go uh, after the squalling passage, the uh, Niami site, you can see a wake of high PV, and that's connected with the melting uh, in the stratiform region that, that covers a huge extensive area. Next. I've repeated the, the panels at 600 on the left in this slide, just what we saw before showing this large wake of PV behind the line. And on the right is a uh, the, uh, same panels, but at 500 HPA. And uh, if you hit the next, uh, you can see here there, there's a PV anomaly 
that extrudes down from the north into the region and eventually at 24 plus 24 hours uh, enters into the uh, region just behind the squall line. So here we have uh, two features, uh, different source, two PP sources. One is associated with melting and another appears to be um, anticyclonic Rossby wave breaking. Although we need to look into this in more detail and go by looking at analyses farther to the north that comes into the uh, region and amplifies uh, the PV behind this squall system. Next. So to summarize here, we have a composite uh, that shows that uh, if we look at the composite PV structure, we see an enhanced PV behind these squall systems. And um, by the way, two of these squalls became uh, topical cyclones, Debbie and Ernesto. And it's uh, the merger of the PV anomalies from two sources, uh, one associated with the melting uh, that extends this PV anomaly a little bit lower down and the other uh, from um, the Saharan heat low, uh, basically, area uh, that has the PV uh, increase higher at a higher level. So you get an expansion and strengthening of the PV anomaly, uh, which could potentially then uh, provide for more potent seedling disturbances for Atlantic tropical cyclone genesis, perhaps a mechanism seen in no other part of the world because of the unique uh, um, situation over West Africa. So uh, the last slide is this one here next. Uh, we've looked at convection uh, connected with African easterly waves uh, and it typically takes the forms of squall lines uh, with leading convective lines and trailing stratiform precipitation. The radar and sounding data from the, the AMA are used to investigate the characteristics and the composite of AMA squall system re reveals a prominent mid tropospheric composite of PV anomaly in the trailing stratiform uh, precipitation region, which has two sources a squall line dynamical microphysical processes, namely melting, and secondly, deep atmospheric boundary layer of the Sahara layer, which gets uh, pulled into the uh, squall system from the north. The merging of these two anomalies can yield potent incipient disturbances for TC genesis over the uh, uh, Eastern Atlantic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, for that very insightful uh, account of the of the way West African monsoon uh, is manifest. I think th this is very uh, detailed, and, and in fact, I, I'm amazed that the AMAP data is still feeding uh, so much, uh, so many studies in, in helping us understand the West African monsoons. Uh, this is great. Uh, we actually ran out of time, uh, but at the same time, I think we can take one quick question if anyone has uh, from the uh, uh, people who have joined the WebEx uh, session. Madhu? You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Very good presentation, sir. I, I would like to ask that uh, this mid-level uh, potential vorticity plays an important role where it's connected to the mid-level moistening uh, through uh, potential vorticity because of uh, the vorticity causes the merging of many clouds. I just want your view on that, sir. Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understood a question about the... Uh... Uh, what role does moisture play? I, I, I couldn't quite follow the full question. The potential vorticity in the mid levels are connected to the moistening of the mid levels or the African, uh, like 700 to 600 hectopascal. The moistening of that uh, thing is a preconditioning for the convection invigoration there. I must apologize. I, I still couldn't quite get the question. Um, but I, uh, uh, but I'm, let me ask answer a uh, point on a different uh, thing. Perhaps as of interest to the Indian monsoon, these monsoon depressions I think have a lot of stratiform precipitation, and this similar process may play a role in helping to spin up 
uh, these circulations. Yeah, maybe uh, Madhu, you can probably put your question in the chat box and then uh, get the answer uh, during the course of this session. So now we will move on. Thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, for that excellent presentation uh, uh, on the West African monsoon. Uh, now we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Mrityunjai Mohapatra, who is the Director General of Meteorology, uh, IM, India Meteorological Department, and also the permanent representative of India with WMO. Uh, in fact, he will be getting into another important aspect that is impact based forecasting. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra is uh, very well known in for his contribution to cyclone forecasting. In fact, he is popularly known as the cyclone man of India. So he actually will be talking about uh, the monsoon forecasting uh, on short to medium range scales uh, and how impact based forecasting uh, is, uh, uh, is, is uh, happening and what is the current progress and, and what are the plans. Dr. Mohapatra, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, and Dr. Roskumar, uh, and distinguished uh, panelists. Once again, I convey my greetings to all the distinguished delegates and participants for this International Workshop on Monsoon and for this special session on the ground monsoon. So I'll be talking about the short to medium range impact based forecast of monsoon in India, the progress and plans. Uh, my slide is moving, and uh, Rukmar Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fine. Yeah. So you know that um, uh, southeastern monsoon is uh, uh, a predominant weather system affecting all socio-economic activity in the region, and the southeast monsoon starts in the month of May and continues um, till the middle of October. During this period, as the monsoon uh, intensifies gradually and moves towards the north, we encounter a number of severe weather events. To top all the severe weather events, we experience the heavy rainfall, leading to thunderstorms, floods, and landslides in different parts of the country and this region. We also experience the thunderstorms associated with weather like lightning, gust, squall, and dust dumps. And there are many low pressure systems developing during monsoon season that includes low depressions and cyclones. During onset phase of monsoon, we also experience the heat wave conditions. And sometimes during the break monsoon conditions, also there are heat wave conditions. The heat wave conditions aggravate during monsoon, especially over northern parts of the country, when you have the monsoon because of the combined impact of temperature and relative humidity. As you can find out from this uh, uh, graphics that the southeast monsoon for the country contributes about 70 to 90 percent, on the average is 74 percent of rainfall during this June to September, if you consider. Then if you consider the internal variability of monsoon, you will find that though there is an SEO rainfall of about 88 centimeter over the country as a whole, it has a variation of 10% for the country as a whole, but spatially there is a large variation from west to east and from north to south. The monsoon is orographically dominant and hence leading to many severe weather events in the orographically dominant regions like the Himalayan region and the Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. So, if you just look at over the years, the monitoring and forecasting in the short to medium range, you will find that there is a significant improvement with respect to all these severe weather events which are occurring in the monsoon season. Especially if you talk of the cyclones, yes, there has been um, almost zero error in many extremely severe cyclone storms passing over the area in the recent years. As a result, it has led to the minimization of loss of lives and properties. You can find out an example here, the super cyclone Ampan, which crossed uh, during the onset phase of monsoon in 2020, May. You will find that it was well predicted, not only with the genesis, or track, intensity, and associated severe weather. There has been about 40% improvement in accuracy of various types of severe weather events, including monsoonal heavy rainfall, the cyclones, the heat, 
UFs and the thunderstorms in the recent five years compared to previous five years. You can also find out monsoonal heavy rainfall. We stand at now about 75% accuracy in 24 hours ahead and 60% accuracy five days ahead in predicting the occurrence of heavy rainfall. Similarly, thunderstorms we can look at, we can predict the thunderstorms about 85% POD one day in ahead and also three hours ahead in the non-casting scale. So when we have got such a good forecast accuracy, but still what we find that the loss of property continues. So now the question is why the good forecast result in poor response? An accurate and timely weather warning does not guarantee always the safety of lives. I'll show some examples. It is mainly because the weather models and other hazard models are not coupled every time. And there is lack of scientific and technical capacity to translate the hazard information into the impacts. There is inadequate communication channels which can fail during the event to reach out to the last mile. And there is lack of appreciation and utilization of available vulnerable information like maps, geophysical, geospatial with higher resolutions. And also many countries and many times with the specific severe weather, we may not have the effective decision support system. So that's why if you just find out uh, the impact of, for example, the cyclones losses in different countries in the Southeast and region, you'll find that there's a huge loss in terms of the absolute value, also capital and other social losses. So if I take an example of the, the severe weather events, this is the cyclone Tithili, which crossed northern parts of Andhra Pradesh uh, and during the withdrawal phase of monsoon in the uh, month of October with the monsoonal gyre. And um, we could provide, provide a very good forecast about the track intensity landfall, but still 77 people died in Odisha because of the landslides. So landslide, there was no prediction mechanism and hence the impact in terms of the severe weather of landslides would not be provided to the people and hence people were trapped in the landslides. Similarly, if you just consider another example, in 2013, the Kedarnath floods in Uttarakhand of India, there also you will find that though there was forecast, but the impact forecast was not there. Hence, people could not understand and could not take action to minimize the losses, and more than 4,000 people died in one event. Now, if you just um, uh, considering all these things, so what we want actually, we want a paradigm shift from a simple forecasting to the impact-based forecasting. So from information-based forecast to the impact-based information and its best warning. So for this purpose, we not only need observations, forecast, and warning, but also we need observations, forecast, expected impacts, and risk-based warning. So to carry out this, so what um, um, the issues, if you look at the issues, first is the challenge, then you, because you are shifting from simple forecasting to the impact-based forecasting, then it comes the methodology. The methodology differs from country to country and over the period of time or so. Then you need some kind of solution towards the decisions and you have to practice whatever you introduce operationally. So objective is that the weather forecast is being converted to impact forecast, which will help in a hasty decision to a well-prepared decision by the disaster managers. While doing so, we have to go for an integrated data system, data utilization instead of the isolated data, then we have to go for an interactive mechanism instead of only broadcasting the information to the disaster managers, to the general public. And above all, we should keep user first design concept. So far, many national meteorological agencies, they feel the priority in formulating their weather forecast without taking into consideration the user's mindset, user's design except the user's expectations. So the impact of focus starts with user's first design concept. So therefore we will be converting the weather information into the response mechanism to weather translation and impact estimation. So therefore as a weather forecaster, we were feeling that we have a lot of information which will be useful to the user, but user feels they have a lot of information which is not linked to the weather at present. So therefore these two wages of green and um, orange they have to merge with each other so that um, uh, they can work together, becoming a rectangle. So what we need there for actually a collaboration mechanism among the weather forecasters and the risk managers to have a realistic risk-based warning. 
So in the in this background, India Metrology Department has uh, um, taken up the steps for implementation of impact test forecast during monsoon season, especially, and also for other seasons. So what we do in this, actually, we try to understand the warning needs for early actions through various meetings with the national testimony authority, state testimony authority. Then there we go for partnership and collaboration with many agencies within the country and outside. At the same time, we go for hazard forecasting. We try to prepare various types of severe weather indices and hazard modeling. It goes towards the risk assessment. Then we assume, then you assess the likelihood impact with the probability forecast and many other. And uh, by that, um, we come for the level of impact. So considering all these um, left hand side, right hand side, as it is shown here, we go for the impact forecast, then we go for dissemination and prepare for the early action. Then of course, we have to go for verification, review and improvement of the system. So when you consider all these things, we are following the four standard uh, methods. The first method we adopted is the threshold method that is defined a forecast threshold at which people or infrastructure in a specific location are expected to be negatively impacted. Then we go for the second method that is qualitative combination method where we create a composite index that combines relative um, vulnerability with forecasted hazard magnitude and create a relative priority then third method, we go for the impact modeling methods. There, what we do is we combine the hazard magnitude with the vulnerability and exposure to predict the level of impact. And finally, we go for the climate sensitive method using a combination of the socioeconomic baseline data and climate data and identify the areas where vulnerability is most closely correlated with the forecasted climate risks. So if I look at all these things where we stand now, for stage one forecast, the stage one impact risk forecast, we started very early. For example, in 2013, we started this color coded warning for the heavy rain during monsoon season after the Kedarnath episode. Every disaster gives a lesson. After that, we started this one, and this was just based on the simple mechanism of giving heavy rainfall, very heavy rain for an extremely heavy rainfall, and giving a color code just based on the own experience of the forecasters. So by that way, we just made a beginning about the heavy rainfall impact based forecast. But in the stage two, we came up with some kind of qualitative combination with the different types of thresholds. So we defined whether it will be one day rainfall, whether it will be com well, the composite of two days rainfall. And by that way, we could find out the hazard modeling and hence the expected impacts. In the stage, Three, if we just look at, we went for implementing the impact based forecast for heavy rain for during monsoon season in four stages. We issued 48 hours in advance or three to four days in advance a heavy rain for watts at the district level. So all the districts in the state were given the warning about the impact expected due to the heavy rain for. Then it was followed by the stage two, that is heavy rain for alert 48 hours in advance. Then heavy rainfall warning 40, 24 hours in advance. In a stage four, 12 hours prior to occurrence, we started giving every three hour information. So while doing all this in the stage three, what we do is we collected the climatological data of the past impact based on different thresholds. The climatological impact expected we consider based on disaster weather events published by India Metrology Department since um, 1980s. So all these um, helped to have a, some kind of impact matrix at the district level and at the city level. The accordingly impact was provided. So therefore, uh, by 2020, we could come up, in spite of the COVID scenario, as uh, some kind of standardized standard operating procedure for four stage impact risk forecast at capital cities and all the districts. Then we want to put stage four in 2021. Partially dynamic impact based forecast. Here, all districts throughout the country were provided based on certain dynamical information generated. I'll show you certain examples. We considered climatology, considered geophysical information, exposure, vulnerability maps, etc. And hence, we have now a GIS based platform with all this data 
and where we can mark the information and take a decision. So this is just an example. What do we do with respect to monitoring the heavy rainfall so that we can provide realistic information every three hours to the general public and industrial managers? Then we went for predicting the rainfall. A lot of information has been developed recently by the dynamical statistical modeling, ensemble modeling, and also the multimodal ensemble scheme of Minister of Power Sciences involving IMD, IATM, and then National Center for Media Management the Forecasting. All these are being utilized to have a realistic forecast and hence the guidance for the impact. So if you just uh, look at the module what we have developed for impact-based forecast of the rainfall during monsoon season, here we'll see that we have considered the not only the immediate rainfall, but also the past few days rainfall is accumulative, to assess the soil moisture, and assess the standing water, and hence the impact of the forecast rainfall. So we consider the climate extremes also, we consider forecast up to five days rainfall, and then we go for sector specific products in the production module and standardized SOP and customized bulletins. In the meantime, also we went for capacity building by conducting the training for the forecasters and the stakeholders. So if you just look at um, the same thing it is represented here, so what we do actually, we consider the administrative layers like state, district, city, ward boundary, the digital elevation models, land use, land cover data, rainfall data, infrastructure layers, demographic data, then major point of interest data like school, college, hospitals, airport, bus stand, communication, etc. So these are all under development, but to a large extent we have developed the framework as it is on here. Now, if we just look at some of the data what we've collected, it is very difficult to collect data for impact risk forecast. So what we have done actually, we have gone for two sources. One is the open source data set, Pan India, it's shown in the left hand side figure. The other one is the government sources as data collected from state governments and other agencies. You can find out that data collection is picking up the entire country is still not uh, having all the data. We consider all types of exposure conditions as mentioned here, up to the power sectors, communication sector, tourist spots, water bodies, transport sectors, and many more. So if you just look at an example of uh, the impact of heavy rainfall, the hazard modeling, short or impact modeling, what we have done actually, Apart from all these heavy rainfall forecasts, we've gone for urban flood modeling. So starting with two cities, we have taken up Mumbai and Chennai, where urban flood modeling has been demonstrated with all the socioeconomic data and it being provided in case of anticipated heavy rainfall. To take care of the flash flood which occurs during the monsoon season, especially over the hilly area, we have a Southwest South Asia Plus for guidance system where we provide the guidance for next 48 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours, and six hours in terms of flood depth, flood threat and the flood risk. For river and flooding, Central Water Commission and India Meteorological Department work together. And with the prediction of heavy rainfall and quantitative precipitation forecast, the color-coded impact risk forecast is being provided by the Central Water Commission of uh, Minister of Water Resources, Government of India. There, I just want to mention, there is involvement of the stakeholders in the form that National Disaster Management Authority, India Meteorological Department, and Central Water Commission meet together every day through video conferencing and formulate the impact expected due to the flood over a river catchment. Now, coming to the cyclone, which occurs uh, in the monsoon season, especially during onset phase and withdrawal phase, so we have a very systematic approach over the period it has developed. We have a genesis forecast 15 days ahead, then five to seven days ahead, we have the major range forecast, then it follows with the track forecast, intensity forecast, structure forecast, landfall point and time forecast, adverse weather warning, and damage expected, and action suggested. And the forecasts are very user-specific and sector-specific. It goes to all disaster managers, the coastal shipping, port warning, fisherman warning, aviation, public, media, etc. in different stages, like pre-cyclone watch, cyclone alert, cyclone warning, post landfall outlook, and, of course, the de-warning. <clears throat> While picking the impact risk forecast in 90s, we went for the historical damages with different stages. Just based on the different stages of the intensity of the cyclone, we could find out the, what is the damage expected and action suggested. Initial was adopted in 1990s, but over the period it has uh, been formulated and reviewed as for the expectation in consultation with the disaster managers. But finally, in the recent years, we have got a dynamic impact risk system. I'll just give an example of the cyclone number, which was a super cyclone and crossed West Bengal and adjoining Bangladesh coast on 20th May during the onset phase of monsoon. You can find out that the first and foremost requirement for impact forecast is the realistic, reasonably correct 
the track and intensity forecast. As you can find out, red one is the forecast track, black one is the actual track. They were almost coinciding with each other five days ahead. And that gave a <coughs> enabler, that give that become an enabler to take the impact forecast seriously by the disaster managers and to take actions. So if you just find out the CPAC weather and the impact expected with the cyclones, these are mainly the heavy rainfall leading to floods. And you have got the weeds leading to damages, the structure and the storm surge leading to coastal inundation. This is just an example. You can find out that we have done, uh, first we have done for climate tourism hazard analysis. We have identified the various districts which are prone to the storm surge hazards or wind hazards or the maximum precipitation hazards. On the left hand side, you can find the probable maximum probable precipitation, which is expected with the cyclone. On the right hand side, you can see the flood zones in Ampan and the affected population number because of the floods. And on the bottom, you can find out what are the various types of social attributes which are expected to be damaged by the cyclones. All these attributes are being prepared on real time and being provided to the district collectors and the state authorities and national authorities to take prepared actions. And you'll be happy to know that based on all these nowadays, Government of India has introduced the response mechanism in which the financial forecast is being provided based on this and government sends money to the states prior to landfall of the cyclones. Now, if you just look at the wind, you can find out that uh, India Environmental Department is a very good um, mechanism for monitoring the wind and its impact. All types of uh, uh, platform, including satellite, radar, coastal observations, climatology are in hand, and we provide the forecast for 28 knots, 34 knots, 50 knots, 64 knots. I want to say that unlike other ocean basins, here we provide the wind speed forecast more than 28 knots. It's mainly because that our ocean basin is strong, so small, and also the fishermen here are poor comparatively, and therefore boats cannot sustain even the wind more than 28 knots. So therefore, this type of wind impact forecast helps the fishermen to save their property and also to save their lives. Now, if we just look at the wind hazard analysis, for example, Ampan, this left hand side diagram is the probable maximum wind as per our analysis uh, for different districts along the coast. And here is an example of the wind speed forecast and impact over the West Bengal due to the cyclone Ampan. You can find out how clearly this GIS based dynamic risk assessment atlas is bringing out the expected impacts. Now, this is an example of the storm surge modeling, impact modeling, and hazard analysis. On the right hand side, you can find the probable maximum storm surge analysis based on the long term data. And here we have got three models one is the nomogram, other one is the storm surge model developed by IIT Delhi. Then we've got NPS advanced circulation model to provide the coastal inundations. All these three are being utilized to provide inundation. And this is an example of inundation provided in the cyclone Ampan for the coastal districts of West Bengal. And accordingly, the different structures and different uh, facilities and utilities which are exposed to these storm surge that were predicted and information are available to the government and other agencies to take the actions. Now coming to the uh, Another important hazard which occurs in monsoon, that is the thunderstorm. You know that in the thunderstorm, we have the lightning, we have got the squalls and gustness, we have got the hailstorms, and also we have got the floods sometimes because of the heavy rain, especially in Northeast India. So therefore, the vulnerability are quite high due to the lightning and other hazards in the thunderstorm. You can find out, uh, I have just uh, noted down here, the various types of impacts of the thunderstorm necessary to weather, which made people the vulnerable. So what we did actually, we started initially with a threshold mechanism, giving the different colors like green, yellow, orange, red, depending upon the winds associated, depending upon the um, uh, expected uh, gust and squalls, and um, depending upon the hailstorms and etc. We also consider what is proposed the climate logic of various parameters like hailstorm, storm, tornado, strong winds, etc. By that way, we could find out some kind of vulnerability mapping by considering those winds which has led to the damage to the structures and loss of lives that is also mapped. And this is just an example of how the hazard modeling has been done for thunderstorms with respect to dynamical models and also with respect to observational data sets from satellites and radars. So what we do now actually, all these informations are being integrated with the socioeconomic attributes as it is shown for the monsoonal heavy rainfall and the cyclones. So, um, this is just an example how the dust storms can also have the impact along with the hell storms and plots. 
So this is another example of what we are doing actually. We have developed some kind of vulnerability atlas of India at the district level and also the city specific level. We have developed the climate hazard vulnerability atlas of India by IMD, as you can be seen in this diagram here. It provides the vulnerability due to various types of thunderstorms, lightning, dust storms, and health storms. Now, last but not the least, that is the heat wave conditions. As you will all know that um, uh, India is very prone to uh, high temperatures, especially in the month of June, July. And for that purpose, we continuously monitor and provide some kind of heat wave warning. And at present, we have a heat action plan across the country and for all the different cities where we provide the information about the heat wave and expected impact in collaboration with various health agencies, state government agencies, central government agencies, and municipal corporations. This is just an example of the heat wave warning in a multi hazard map. To further aid the vulnerability assessment and hence the risk, what we have gone for that we have prepared the wind impact and relative humidity impact. We have calculated the normalized vulnerability index of the heat wave and also the uh, climatology of heat wave based on long period data. As you can see, this is the month of June. All these informations are for the month of June, for example. You can find out the central part of the country, how vulnerable it is towards uh, the heat wave conditions, even there is monsoon. <clears throat> we also try to develop some kind of heat hazard analysis for the month of June, as it is shown here, considering various parameters. So for example, consider only maximum temperature or minimum temperature, duration of heat wave, relative humidity, and wind speed above normal temperature days and some of all the weights we consider and to find out to try to zonation to do a zonation of various types of districts in the country depending upon all these parameters so finally we have come up with gis based uh, heat wave information uh, where we have the specific attributes for example it is shown here indian railways and national highways there is transport sector which is affected by the heat waves if there is a uh, uh, train passing from Delhi to Calcutta, then there is heat wave conditions across the road, then the authority has to make arrangement for uh, AC conditions, the water conditions, drinking water specially, and other arrangements. Individuals also make arrangement for that purpose. Therefore, the association attributes leading to this impact with forecast of heat wave, especially the monsoon season, is certainly helping the people to minimize the loss of lives. As all of us know, that number of loss of lives is reduced significantly due to the heat wave also. There was only four deaths last year compared to 2,000 deaths in 2015. Now, while uh, summarizing, I'll say that IVF in India Metrology Department has come up a long way with respect to methodology. We have come up with the objective methodology and objective hazard modeling, impact modeling, and we are in the process to add the socioeconomic attributes. So there has been uh, some color coding to begin with, then we have gone for extra, introducing the temporal range up to five days, then spatial range of one of two locations, city, districts, and region level. Forecast, we've gone up to probabilistic forecast modeling system. Then hazard type, we have considered all types of hazards as mentioned here. And language, we have come up with initially English, but now we have got tri-language, that is English, Hindi, and the local language. All the sector-specific informations are being provided almost in a semi-automatic method, utilizing all types of dissemination, in local language that is helping the local media and the people. So if you just look at um, the future plan, this uh, stage four of the impact and risk modeling, which is going on now, it will improve further. And by 2025, we should have a reasonably accurate impact-based forecast and risk-based warning system in the country for all types of severe weather up to five days at station level and at the district level. <clears throat> Now, if I just look at uh, another challenging for this purpose is the decision support system, which is underway to develop for each and every individual uh, severe weather. And then, of course, we'll go for a multi hazard warning system. So, if I just look at uh, while introducing all these things, verification is very important. And at present, we do not have a quantitative verification of the impact based forecast that we introduced from next year. So, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to speak on this evolving impact-based forecast risk based warning system in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahapatra, for that very comprehensive and really interesting uh, presentation. In fact, uh, this actually is very encouraging that we are now finally uh, able to uh, achieve the full value chain benefits of weather and climate services.
Uh, but of course, the real challenge is actually to get a handle on, on vulnerability and exposure, as you have rightly highlighted, uh, which actually is based on human systems. And it may be uh, uh, quite a big challenge for us, for methodologists, uh, to actually get into. So we definitely need partnerships with uh, the concerned stakeholders. Unfortunately, we ran out of time completely. In fact, we are now uh, behind, but at least if uh, anyone has a burning question, probably one question we can uh, uh, have before we break. I see no hands. So thank you very much, Dr. Mohapatra. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, this very uh, informative uh, talk. So now we will have a break for about since we are behind the time, we'll break for about 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, reconvene at... 10.15 uh, local. Yeah, 10.15 local. That will be uh, 4.45 UTC. Okay.
Hi, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. <laughs> good morning. Okay, good morning. <laughs> Here it's almost 2 a.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not a very easy time to, to uh. give a talk. <laughs> Uh, can we start? Yeah, I oh, well, uh, could you just remind, remind me how to share so I have to, sh to share my, my screen? screen? Yeah, full screen you share. Uh, so here. Okay. And now what do I do? Then you go to your PowerPoint and... Uh... No, 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 no. First you share the screen, madam. Pardon? Yeah. At the bottom yeah, of the screen, screen, you can see three options. Mute, start video, and share. So click on the share. Um, I'm trying here, but... But since the presentation is already... Or, or shall we... we... The organizers, they can share it, if you like. It says, I tried last week and it worked. No, I don't. Alice, no? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe the organizers can share, Alice. Yeah, we can share from our end. Uh, I would uh, I would rather control the presentation. Yeah, that is true. Uh, this, is, this is who has said you have said our organizer has said this one. Somebody try to so, so madam at the bottom of this app you can see this mute start video and share. Start now. The, uh, the 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 video is already on. Share. And, uh, One more option. Share. Do you see a button called share with an arrow, upward arrow? It's in the bottom. Yeah, I I I I have already. Uh, click on the share. share chosen, uh, yes, click it on this uh, option. But I, I, I don't know why. This Are you thing. getting any permission issues? So I, I should choose a full screen or so, just yeah. a window? On the leftmost screen. panel, you can see screen one. Or full screen, full screen that is better. Yeah, I, I am I am clicking on the full screen, but nothing yeah, happens. After, by clicking leftmost panel, then there is one more click you need to do, share. Now it's... Um, it doesn't... Can you yeah. share from our end? I see and I click on the options, but uh, nothing happens. So, so perhaps we, uh, perhaps we then uh, get the presentation from your side then. Okay, okay. Bushar, can you okay. share? Yeah. I think that is better. Okay, welcome back everyone. So the next presentation, I, we, we go to the uh, another aspect of regional monsoons in terms of the American monsoon. So we now have uh, Professor Alice Grimm, uh, who is a full professor in the Department of Physics in the Federal University of Parana in Brazil. So she will be speaking about uh, interannual. Oops. Inter now. So she will be speaking about interannual and interseasonal variability of the South American monsoon. Uh, Professor Grimm uh, has, has a long experience in working on the American monsoons and she is well known. Uh, she's also uh, served as uh, a member of the uh, 
WCRP Clivar Chivex Monsoon Spanner. Uh, so uh, we look forward to her uh, presentation on the South American monsoon. Professor Grieb, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I will talk about the combination of interannual and intraseasonal variability of the South American monsoon, uh, focusing on the MGO modulation by ENSO. Next, please. Here you can have uh, an idea of the intensity and of the uh, extension of the South American monsoon. Uh, so uh, from the annual cycles of precipitation, uh, you can see that most of South America is uh, dominated by monsoon regime with much rainfall during summer and almost no rainfall at all in winter. And uh, in the uh, figure uh, on the right, uh, you can see the uh, average, monthly average of precipitation in several monsoon uh, core regions around the world. So you can have an idea of the intensity of the South American monsoon. Next. Uh, well, let's first uh, give you uh, an idea about interannual variability in uh, South America. Uh, and of, uh, an idea of the importance of ENSO for this interannual variability. So here you have the continental modes of interannual variability for total annual rainfall and uh, seasonal rainfall. Uh, only the first modes, uh, just for summer, uh, we are showing the two first modes because summer is our focus in this presentation. In all these first modes for annual total, winter, spring, autumn, you can see a very strong influence of uh, ENSO on these first modes of variability. Here in the, in the summer, uh, when I, I talk about summer, I am referring to austral summer. Uh, it is the second mode which is related to ENSO. And it doesn't uh, impact very much on the core monsoon region, actually. But the first mode has a very high factor loading on this uh, core monsoon region. Although it is not uh, strongly connected to a well-known SST pattern. Next. Uh, the mechanisms for ENSO impact on South America uh, are local forcing, as in Western tropical South America, and atmospheric teleconnections, which actually uh, are the main mechanism of uh, the influence of ENSO on South America. Uh, these teleconnections can follow a tropical pathway, um, through equatorial, uh, Kelvin and Rossby wave, which change the Walker circulation as in Eastern equatorial South America and an extra tropical pathway uh, through Rossby wave trains, which produce, uh, uh, which are produced by Pacific tropical convection uh, and this uh, extra tropical teleconnection change circulation and precipitation here in subtropical uh, South America. Next. Next, please. Uh, besides uh, teleconnections, 
another uh, me mechanism of uh, variability uh, in, in, uh, of rainfall in South America is uh, surface atmosphere interaction. There is a relationship between precipitation and spring and summer uh, in such a way that uh, there is a, a tendency to reversal of anomalies here in, uh, in this region, in this Cormonsoon region, from spring to summer. There are uh, significant correlations between these modes in spring and summer, and um, a mechanism, an, an explanation for this tendency to reversal was tested uh, with uh, regional model. Next, please. Well, and this can also be seen here in the evolution of precipitation in central East Brazil compared with uh, climatological precipitation evolution. Next. Uh, here we have then uh, for December, January, and February, the anomalies, the precipitation anomalies during El Nino. Uh, uh, we have uh, below normal precipitation in the Northeast uh, South America and above normal here in Central East and Southeast South America. In the opposite, more or less, uh, during Lani. Next, please. Uh, next. So uh, let's introduce uh, the intraseasonal variability in South America. Here we have the, the contribution of synoptic and intraseasonal time scales to total variance of summer rainfall in South America. You can see that intraseasonal variability has a great contribution here in Central East South America. Is, uh, is a very significant contribution. Uh, while um, synoptic variability has a much stronger contribution here in the Western part. Uh, looking at the interseasonal variability here in this region, uh, it's possible to see that this variability has components in uh, three main variability bands from 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and 30 to 70 days. And uh, this, this spectra of this uh, vari intraseasonal variability in this region shows that uh, compared with the uh, reference uh, red noise, uh, the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is here in this band, uh, has a very significant contribution. Next, please. Uh, the first three rotated modes in the uh, intraseasonal time scales are these ones. So we have uh, the, uh, the three modes are actually among the five uh, uh, mo uh, first modes of all these in, in these three bands, time uh, frequency bands. So these two first modes are dipole-like modes. One uh, with highest factor loadings here over the South Atlantic convergence zone. Next, please. And uh, here in this 30 to 70 day band, it's possible to see it's the first mode and this is the second mode. And this mode here, uh, this second mode is connected with equatorial circulation, uh, uh, either a westerly or a easterly regime for wet and dry phases, whereas this mode here is connected with extratropical uh, perturbation. Next, please. Next. So let's first take a look 
at the uh, madim julian oxidation impacts uh, in uh, average over uh, all three possible enzo states neutral state el nino and la nina so without uh, discriminating by enzo state so we can see that the uh, most uh, the, the strongest uh, convection, it uh, propagates from the Indian Ocean uh, till Central Pacific, where uh, it uh, extends southeastward here in the uh, South Pacific, in the subtropics of the Central East South Pacific. And when this happens, uh, uh, starts uh, uh, enhanced convection over the Central East South America, which reaches its maximum in phase one of MTO. Next, please. Uh, when, uh, when we have this uh, enhanced connection here or suppressed convection in, in phase four, uh, there is also in the subtropics in, the, in South Pacific here, uh, strong low level convergence here and low level divergence here. Uh, in this, these regions, in the subtropics of the Central East South Pacific are, according to analysis of influence functions, uh, very efficient regions in, in which anomalous upper level divergence or convergence are very efficient in producing uh, extratropical teleconnections towards South America to produce uh, circulation anomalies and uh, precipitation anomalies. Next, please. Next. Well, here we can see uh, that, uh, oops. Uh, let's look uh, just at, well, here we can see then this uh, in phases three and four, uh, low level convergence here uh, and in phases seven and eight, low level, uh, high level, this is high level, high level divergence and here high level uh, convergence associated with suppressed, here in this case, with suppressed uh, convection and here enhanced convection. Next, please. Uh, well, here it's possible to see uh, that while you have this, this anomalous convection, upper level divergence uh, in the equatorial belt, uh, and not much anomalous convection in the subtropics, uh, there is no pattern of extratropical teleconnection here over the Pacific. But when this upper level anomalous divergence extends into this uh, influence region here in the subtropics, uh, extratropical teleconnection starts forming here. And it's delineated in phase eight, start forming in, in phase seven, delineated in phase eight and fully established in phase one, when the anomalous convection over South America is at its maximum. Next, please. And then in phase one, we have the highest precipitation here, which can reach 
more than four millimeters per day, the anomalies uh, filter in uh, intraseasonal bands, so anomalies from other sources are not included. And this represents uh, around 35% of climatology. So it's a, a, a pretty strong uh, impact. And in these other phases, we have suppressed convection. Next, please. <clears throat> well, these, uh, which of these uh, anomalies, convection anomalies here in the Pacific are responsible for forming this uh, wave train here, responsible for these anomalies over South America. We, uh, we use it, these upper level divergence as, as forcing in a simple model, and we are able to reproduce this wave train with uh, anticyclonic and cyclonic circulation here. Uh, but what exactly, uh, what, which of these anomalies is, is responsible actually by these circulation anomalies over South America? So looking at influence function, uh, for these two action centers here, of this anticyclonic and cyclonic circulation here, we see that in this region here, where there are the strongest convection anomalies, this region here in the subtropics of Central East, South Pacific, this, two, this region here, is the most efficient region to produce these two circulation anomalies. Next, please. <clears throat> and this is confirmed with uh, uh, simulations using uh, as forcing only parts of these convection anomalies. So using this one, we don't get the right anomalies over South America, uh, neither from these or the combination of the two. But when we use this here uh, in, in the subtropics of the, uh, the Central East South Pacific, we get exactly this, this uh, wave train connecting to South America. So the most important uh, convection anomaly is not uh, the, the, the strongest one, is that one which is situated in a region of, of the highest influence. Next, please. <clears throat> so now let's see what ENSO changes in MGO. So first, uh, let's see. Just a moment. <clears throat> Let's start with the ENSO influence on the frequency of MGO phases. So here we have the relative frequency of MGO phases during El Nino, La Nina, and neutral years. Huh? Uh, it seems that the background ENSO-related anomalies influence the relative occurrence of MGO phases with similar patterns of circulation or convection anomalies. For instance, uh, MGO phase one here on the left, it's relatively more frequent during El Nino and shares some common features with El Nino, for instance, suppressed convection over the equatorial eastern Indian Ocean and western Pacific and maritime continent here, while enhanced convection predominates over the equatorial central Pacific, which is uh, something that is observed here uh, during El Niño. Uh, 
On the other hand, the phase five, uh, which is relatively more frequent in La Nina, uh, displays opposite uh, common features with La Nina. Next, please. Well, in ENSO states, in, uh, how ENSO states affect the MGO propagation. Here we can see that quicker, well, we know from previous work that quicker or slower propagation is expected for weaker or stronger convection. During La Nina, the stronger convection here over the maritime continent, here the Eastern Pacific, and the western uh, the eastern indian ocean and western pacific uh, uh, this stronger convection is consistent with slower eastward propagation as can uh, be seen here uh, comparing with el nino uh, uh, du during el nino the anomalous convection over the maritime continent is weaker and does not reduce much as it moves uh, over the maritime continent to the Western Pacific. Uh, uh, and it extends further uh, during El Nino uh, into the Central Pacific. Uh, yet during La Nina, the zonal wind anomalies, they propagate quicker over the colder East Pacific and anomalous convection is earlier established here over South America than during El Nino. During El Nino, the, the highest convection anomalies happen in phase one and during La Nina in phase eight. Next, please. <clears throat> well, here uh, we can see some uh, features uh, comparing uh, of OLR anomalies, comparing uh, for El Nino and La Nina, these OLR anomalies. So we can see that uh, during phases eight here, phase eight and one, uh, uh, when MGO uh, displays enhanced convection here in Central Pacific, which is something in common with El Nino. And these anomalies are enhanced here. While during uh, La Nina, they are really not enhanced. They, they are weaker. Huh? Uh, for instance, let me show just one more example here. Um, here in uh, phase five, six, huh? uh, during El Nino, we have a propagation of this enhanced uh, convection uh, across the date line, whereas in La Nina, it doesn't happen. Uh, the, the convection propagates only in the subtropics, but during El Nino, it propagates uh, across the date line and is uh, very enhanced here in phases uh, eight and one. Uh, as a consequence, these uh, subsi uh, anomalous subsidence over Northeast South America, which happens in phases uh, four, five, and six of uh, the MGO. This is enhanced because of this enhancement of this convection in Central Pacific. So subsidence here is strengthened. And during La Nina, this subsidence here disappears. So we have even uh, enhanced convection here. So uh, this influence of the background state of ENSO can, and there, is many, there are many other examples, uh, can uh, change these 
anomalies associated with different phases of MGO. Now, let me uh, emphasize that during phases seven and eight, uh, and here and also here, uh, uh, there is an enhancement of Please. this Excuse me, Alice, uh, anomalous think... convection. Pardon? Excuse me, I think uh, we have to wind up because I think we are running out of time. Thank you. Uh, well, and uh, next, please. Uh, I, oops, I just wanted to uh, to emphasize here that this subtropical convection, which is important to establish this teleconnection towards South America, it is enhanced not only during El Niño, but during La Niña, it's a non-linear effect. This here is the difference between the, uh, the anomalies in El Niño and neutral years. And you can see that in both cases, this subtropical convection is enhanced. And uh, the, the uh, wave train, eh? Uh, is uh, well defined during El Niño and La Niña, while in neutral years it's very weak. Next, just to show the, the effect here on precipitation. These here are uh, anomalies of precipitation, of observed precipitation, it's not OLR, uh, where we can see the effect of enhanced subsidence here over uh, during El Nino, here over Northeast uh, South America, whereas during La Nina, you can see that the subsidence is uh, weaker and we have even enhanced precipitation here. And due to this enhancement of the teleconnections uh, towards South America, we have much stronger uh, precipitation anomalies here in Central East South America than in, North, in neutral years. And over the ZACs, over the South Atlantic Conversion Zone, uh, this is uh, enhanced in both El Nino and La Nina. Uh, I think I'll, I'll uh, stop here, although there, there were some interesting results in extreme events, uh, but due to the uh, time, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Grimm. Uh, sorry for interrupting you and sorry that you are not able to uh, complete the presentation, but we appreciate your uh, flexibility with the timing. I know this is uh, uh, almost more beyond 2 a.m. And it's really nice of you for sparing your time at this hour. And it also shows your commitment to monsoon research and also the uh, uh, workshop on the monsoon. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, your presentation and uh, in case there are any questions, probably we can uh, get in touch with you uh, separately. So we will uh, move on to the next presentation. So the next presentation is by uh, Professor Laila Carvalho, also again on the American monsoons. So she is uh, uh, a professor of geography in UCSB, University of California, in Santa Barbara, and and. Uh, she actually uh, she uh, is one of the co-chairs of the WCRP Clive RGVX Monsoons panel, and she's closely involved with the uh, international workshop and also the International Monsoons Project Office. Uh, so I now invite uh, Professor Carvalho uh, to begin her presentation. She would like to uh, share her presentation by herself, and I hope this works uh, without any problem. Okay, do you see my, my screen? 
everybody? Yes. Yes. We, okay. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. You Perfect. see? Okay. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm Leila Carvalho. Um, and uh, I also would like to, to thank my, my team, my collaborator, Charles, for uh, his, um, his, uh, uh, the PI of this project and uh, all the staff that has been working with us uh, for this project. Um, I, I will start just showing a little outline. I will give a short overview of the South American monsoon variability. Then I will talk about low level jets along the Eastern Andes, and then uh, some classification and analysis of those jets, and I will provide some conclusions. But I have to start by talking about of the monsoon. How we, how, what is the monsoon in South America and how, what are the main features? And then here we see it's just a mean for DJF, mean precipitation and 80, 50 millibar winds uh, showing uh, uh, the main features of this South American monsoon. Very clearly the South Atlantic convergence zone in this region here has this oceanic part and continental part. Here you see the Chaco Low, also very famous. Uh, when you look at upper level, then we also see the Bolivian High uh, as part of the monsoon. But what I like to, to do when I talk about the South American monsoon is to show the monsoon when you remove the mean annual cycle of the winds, because then it looks much more like other monsoons. And what we see here in colors is precipitation, uh, winds are anomaly uh, uh, after removing the annual cycle. So you clearly see the cross equatorial winds. We see a, 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 a cyclonic anomaly in this region related to convection um, and also see the SACZ in this region. We don't actually see much of the Chacolo because this is there year round. Uh, I wanna point out also the importance of this cross equatorial flow to the, uh, to the southern hemisphere as part of the monsoon. But then the monsoon also has active and break phases. At least talk a little bit about this. In the active phase of the monsoon, this is precipitation in color. Vectors are showing winds and I'm showing the actual winds, not anomalies. Um, and then you can see in the active phase, I did this uh, based on an index. I'm not going to discuss this index, but um, this is basically uh, how the active phase um, is, uh, should look like. So you have more precipitation over central and eastern Brazil in this region and less precipitation over northwest Amazon in this region. Then in the break phase, you see more uh, strong easterly winds. We clearly see more of the anticyclonic rotation in here, less precipitation over eastern uh, Brazil and more precipitation over northwestern Brazil. So in, when you take the difference between the two, then we clearly see that you have a less suppressed convection over northwestern Brazil and uh, more uh, precipitation over eastern and also uh, over where you see the, the SACZ region and less precipitation over southeastern uh, uh, South America. All these features are very important and less precipitation also in the ITCZ, which is very interesting uh, when you see the difference between active and break phases. So um, let's talk a little about the jets and the importance of the jets. So there are a few low level jets that are very well known in the Americas. Um, we have the, the uh, they are traditionally studied separately. So we have this famous South America low level jet, which is uh, we see here in this region. Uh, uh, this is Eastern Bolivia. Then we have the, the, uh, the North uh, jet we call Orinoco, some call Orinoco jet. And then you have Caribbean jet, and then you have the Choco jet. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on these two over South America, um, and also trying to understand if if they are related, and how and how they play a role for the monsoon. Um, but before I talk about that, I need to to 
briefly discuss how we, we calculate, how we, we, we use this or found out about the, the jets. So we use the uh, four reanalysis, uh, five reanalysis actually. We use the Bonner criteria, which is the criteria that has been proposed for the United States uh, to define about the, the low level jets. Uh, we, we actually we modify the Bonner criteria to be adapted to South America because this criteria is very tuned to the to the jets that have been studied in the, in the northern hemisphere. So we used similar, we are using winds, uh, wind shear, but we are also using percentiles of the winds. Instead of using thresholds, we use percentile. We use six hourly reanalysis and we look, uh, I'm going to show first uh, by looking at separate regions where we know the jets exist, we are we know climatologically we see the high uh, uh, standard deviation in the winds. We we then we are going to look into this uh, two regions separately. Okay, so when you have these South American low-level jets, the famous jet over eastern uh, Bolivia in this region. Um, if we have a uh, maximum winds in this region over here, they tend to be nocturnal. They are the type of nocturnal type of of a jet. And uh, the importance of this jet is that it transports a lot of moisture from tropical regions to the subtropic. Here, what I'm showing just to to, to emphasize is uh, is the anomaly relative to climatology when you have the jet very strong in this region. So you can clearly see that when we have this low level jet strong, moisture is transported to the subtropics and away from the monsoon. And you see more of the anticyclonic circulation. This is low level um, and then the easterlies and then the relationship with uh, suppressed convection in this region. Um, now we are looking at the northern or in local low level jet again during DJF. So this is the region where we observe the jet um, and then we see this is a composite for the cases, the days when we have those jets. And you can see this is precipitation and winds. And uh, it's very clear uh, where the precipitation is more enhanced. We see enhanced precipitation along the, uh, the Andes region in this region and also along the continental part of the SACZ. Uh, when you contrast these uh, uh, observations with the climatology, again, we see um, more precipitation actually over the monsoon region and a suppressed precipitation where we see the jets is strong. And the reason for that is that, well, you have stronger jets, you have a divergence of the winds, divergence of, of, uh, of moisture fluxes. So you would expect to see less precipitation. And this, this, this moisture is transported by these anomalous uh, westerly winds along the, the region of the monsoon. So this is why this jet is, is important uh, to be uh, well understood. Now I'm showing, uh, this is a, a published in this paper. Um, this is a composite also of this uh, a northern jet, focusing more on the northern jet, uh, showing uh, uh, winds anomalies, SST, and here we are looking at upper levels. We are looking at upper levels because uh, it is clearly showing the wave train, Alice, Alice showed very well, there is often related a wave train propagating over South America when we have convection along the SACZ. And we do see this happening. So there is, even though we have the jet in this region, we clearly see the importance of having both hemisphere um, uh, uh, perturbing uh, circulation um, in both hemispheres. This is upper levels. When you look at low levels, uh, we see that uh, a very clear anticyclonic uh, circulation. This is the, the North Atlantic uh, cyc anticyclone becomes stronger. And this is also important in transporting uh, moisture across the equator towards uh, South America. Uh, in low level, you also see the cyclonic circulation, anticyclonic circulation. So the existence of this jet is a combination of, uh, of uh, interhemispherical dynamics leading to the increase of the jet that ends up affecting the monsoon. 
But most also important is that this jet seems to be increasing, intensifying um, over time. Um, we see that they, they have been uh, increasing in frequency over Venezuela, Colombia, and also in wind speed, as you can see in both cases here, those um, uh, trends are statistically significant, which is also important in, in understanding the variability of the monsoon in recent years. Um, now, if you look at what is the, the seasonal cycle of those jets, you see that um, for the, the Northern Andes is actually peaks in March, but also in the pre-monsoon season, which is which is very important. Um, whereas the the the, the jet uh, at central jet it peaks in the winter, but we have also uh, sometimes you have both jets uh, simultaneously, and I and you know that you have seen as I showed before uh, they act in, in different ways, right? Almost opposite ways but often they appear simultaneously. So we, we are interested in understanding uh, what kind of circulation and when do they happen simultaneously? When do they happen independently? So the way uh, we answered this question was by uh, not being so uh, 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 subjective in defining what the jets are, but uh, allowing more of a, this variability to be recognized um, by uh, the methodology. So what we did, we, we look into the reanalysis, uh, again, winds, um, and, uh, and then we define a mask along Eastern Andes, all this region uh, for, for uh, using all these regions. And then we identify for every grid point when the criteria for a jet was uh, occurring. So we use the same criteria before that we use for some points, but now for all these grid points along the Andes, just to find out about what kind of regimes we, we find. And then we get about 1700 maps um, that uh, uh, pass this criteria. And then we use uh, self-organizing maps SOM uh, to recognize those patterns. Uh, this was an unsupervised uh, neural network tool that uh, used this geospatial data. So here is the data. We have the input data. There are some weights um, that is being applied, and then the methodology, the method finds maps or nodes um, that uh, then we will recognize uh, based on on weights and. Um, as being different patterns. So this methodology, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, but um, it then it, it end up giving uh, this this methodology actually gives 208 nodes, which is a lot. We're not interested in all those possible nodes. So the way um, we do in order to separate what it, what matters to us, we then go through a, a KME clustering method to capture the, the most uh, important modes. In this particular um, method, we end up having some supervision, right? We have to decide how many clusters are important. And then we came up with this uh, after several tests uh, with the, what we thought, thought was ideal. So we have this uh, 10 clusters. And you can see that uh, some of these clusters indicate that you have, uh, say, in this case, more of the northern type of jet uh, that becomes stronger in these four first clusters. Then you have uh, met, uh, some of that show that um, they actually occur simultaneously when you see the color, uh, pink colors indicate strong, strong southerly winds, uh, northerly winds, sorry. And then you see that in some of these clusters, they occur uh, together. And then uh, you see these last three ones I show when you have this eastern central Andes uh, uh, jet stronger, right? So you can use this now to try to understand some of these mechanisms. I'm going to shortly show you uh, the northern jet by itself, right? The simultaneous and the central jet. And what is interesting, I'm, I'm showing uh, uh, lag composites 
um, uh, so leading two days, leading one day, uh, uh, and doing the jet. And you can clearly see how uh, as the jet becomes stronger, uh, a very clear relationship with the westerly winds and intensification of the monsoon. Whereas you see more of the suppression, you see this, this cyclonic, uh, uh, anomalous cyclonic uh, circulation forming here. This is low level, right? And uh, enhancing convection over here along the SACZ where you see the convergence zone. And then if you see when they are the simultaneous, well, they are competing, effects are competing. So we don't see much of this effect. And uh, actually the, north, the, the central end is, uh, seems to, to be more important in enhancing precipitation a little bit in this region. Of course, when you have the central Andes and not the northern Andes, then you have a lot more of this suppression here and uh, moisture transports to southeastern uh, South America and causing extreme events in this region. So in conclusion, um, this South American monsoon is strongly influenced by the behavior of the low-level jets. Uh, this research points out that the north and central low-level jet play a distinct role in modulating the monsoon. The northern jet is more important for the active phase of the monsoon. There is also evidence that the fre frequency and intensity of the northern jet is increasing, which is important. And the SOM is a useful uh, tool to be less arbitrary in identifying the jet and their behavior. And they can be useful to characterize mechanisms associated with the active and break phases of the monsoon. So thank you very much for your attention. And I, I stop sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Laila, for the very interesting presentation and and you are uh, in a way to ways to uh, make diagnostics of the low level jet. I think this is uh, of interest, I think almost for all the, even the other regional monsoons. Uh, so if there are any questions, I think we can take one question if someone has uh, a question. Can you raise your hand if you have a question? Okay, I see no uh, uh, request for floor. So thank you, Laila, for that excellent thank presentation. You. And we appreciate you also for <laughs> late in the night. Yeah, I'm taking my coffee. <laughs> so I can't thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Come on. So the next uh, speaker is, a, uh, of course, very well known uh, uh, monsoon expert internationally uh, celebrated uh, in, in, uh, in the monsoon community, uh, Professor B. N. Goswami. Uh, he needs no introduction to the monsoon community. Uh, he actually has uh, led many uh, programs uh, in the Indian Institute of Science and also uh, more notably in the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. So he, uh, the next presentation is about uh, uh, the teleconnection between uh, North Atlantic SST and the Indian monsoon variability, which is actually a, a new way of looking at the Indian monsoon variability teleconnections. Uh, Professor Goswami, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Rup Kumar. Thank you very much. Can I try to share my screen? If it works, uh, then I'll work, uh, work with uh, my sharing. If it doesn't, I'll quick, quickly go back there. Okay, let me try to share the screen. Okay, you can share. Okay. Is it uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay, great. Then, uh, then I will make it full screen. Uh, is it okay? It's okay, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic. Uh, let me let me. Uh, so why am I talking about uh, this uh, teleconnection between North Atlantic and Indian monsoon rainfall? So basically my talk is about uh, this Indian regional monsoon, Indian monsoon. But uh, in the context of Indian monsoon, I think uh, the drivers of Indian monsoon has been a, uh, has been a, 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 a big question for a long time. And we have uh, known that uh, El Nino is a major driver of Indian monsoon variability. But uh, over the years, we have also known that there are association about uh, uh, Indian monsoon with AMO, 
There is also with IOD, PDO, and NAO. But none of these associations have been uh, have been uh, have uh, 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 the robustness of these associations are not very well established and and uh, whether they are really drivers of monsoon and uh, independent of uh, El Nino has not been established properly. So over uh, so many years, even the causality or the or the direction of drivers, even in the case of El Nino, uh, we are not sure because it is possible that an Indian monsoon can also affect the El Nino, while El Nino can influence the monsoon. So which direction does it work is has not been established even today very well. So one of our concern has been to establish the drivers um, and uh, in that connection, the causality well, has been uh, has been a major concern over the years. So the, which is the, what are the, what what are the drivers which have a direct causal association with monsoon? And in that connection, we have done some uh, recent works uh, where we have established uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, this causality amongst the several of these drivers. And this is the theme of my talk. And uh, I'll come back to this picture here uh, at a later time. So, um, uh, so basically, why is, uh, why we are talking about the connection between uh, the uh, the North Atlantic and, and and Indian monsoon? In the context of this is that uh, that in the <clears throat> as we know, the Indian monsoon is, is a very complex system. Uh, it has uh, several different variability from biennial oscillations to multi-decadal oscillations. Association with El Nino is quite well known. And it is also known from predictability studies that uh, Chandi and Sukla and work, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is considered to be a highly predictable system. And its potential predictability, potential scale has been estimated to be about 0.85. Unfortunately, however, all actual scale of all prediction systems today is less than 0.7, um, uh, uh, and that is uh, 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 that is what we have been able to achieve after monsoon vision. But uh, it has always remained below potential scale. So that is has been a, a major question: why? And that is essentially. Uh, I believe that there are two reasons for that. One is, of course, the models have their own biases, uh, and the prediction models need to improve bias, and that is happening, uh, uh, happening uh, steadily. And however, more than that, we have been not been able to identify all the potential drivers of monsoon clear, clearly and include their contributions into the prediction system uh, properly. And that, I think, is major concern. And in that context, uh, in my talk today is in that context, uh, we, I am going to uh, sort of uh, identify the association with the North Atlantic uh, uh, monsoon as, a, as a, one of the most important potential drivers. And that is, uh, uh, the, the, again, the, uh, the importance of this is, is that over the last uh, uh, last 100 years, uh, Sir Gilbert Walker discovered the sudden oscillation and association with Indian monsoon. And that is, of course, led to the uh, connection with the El Nino and sudden oscillation. So over the, hundred, the last 100 years, uh, the, uh, therefore, ENSO has remained a single most important driver of the Indian monsoon uh, and for its variability and predictability. Unfortunately, the association between monsoon and, and so has been has been has been epochal, has been varying, and over the recent years, in fact, it is very very small, uh, very very low, uh, very poor correlation. And even when it was in the best uh, best of times, their association explains only about thirty five percent of the variability of monsoon. So therefore, a lot of variability is not explained by monsoon. Where does they come from? We must identify them, and that is the need to identify non-answer drivers of monsoon and they uh, and incorporate them into the prediction system. That is why this connection with AMO is important. But uh, what have been the problems? So therefore, we need to go beyond Toga or beyond and so and and Toga. So we have to look beyond tropical SST or maybe even extra tropical SST possibly could influence monsoon. But uh, but. We have not paid enough attention to this. There has been, of course, uh, there has been uh, uh, has been indications that North Atlantic uh, uh, the temperatures indicate uh, influence the monsoon in centennial and longer time scales because mega droughts of Indian monsoon have been associated uh, with uh, with uh, cooling in the North Atlantic, and. Uh, 
Over the last uh, 15 years or so, we have investigated the disk association between monsoon uh, in, in uh, North Atlantic uh, SST and Indian monsoon uh, on interannual and multi decadal time scales. And we find that that is quite a robust, but a robust association. Uh, 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 but there are, some, there are some issues that we need to, needed to clarify, and that is what uh, my talk today is, 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 is on those issues. Teleconnection. <clears throat> Uh, 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 and, 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 and one of the issues, of course, was to establish uh, the, the, what is the physical mechanism by which uh, the North Atlantic SSD could possibly influence monsoon. And so that teleconnection mechanism has, over the years, last decade or so, has become uh, much more clearer. I'm going to give it, uh, give an example of that. Uh, uh, but there are some few major con conceptual concerns uh, because uh, the concern was that uh, the, 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 the tropical SST in print, uh, teleconnection has to happen through this circulation, right? So it is a kind of uh, atmospheric breeze. Atmospheric breeze has to happen through the circulation. But how does the North Atlantic SST, which is a pretty uh, extra tropical SST, which is pretty mean SST, is very cold? How does those cold SST or variations of those cold SST could influence the circulation, which then influence the teleconnection? And that has been a, a, a major conceptual problem because the very unlike uh, unlike uh, unlike tropics, the variations in the mean mean sea surface temperature over extra tropical region or the North Atlantic is much lower. And at that time, uh, even the small change. Uh, uh, I mean, even the large change in SST does not change the evaporation uh, uh, so much and therefore uh, cannot influence the con convection like it does over the, uh, over the tropics. Therefore, there is a question uh, about that. In fact, uh, people, uh, uh, general thinking has been that, uh, uh, the, uh, that, that uh, it is not the SST that influences the circulation in extra tropic, but the circulation affects the SST through fluxes in the extra tropic. This has been a connection. Therefore, there has been always a conceptual problem or how SSD could have influenced this. Uh, but uh, uh, in the next few uh, few slides, I'm going to show that, in fact, SSD can influence the tropical, extra tropical circulation, not on synoptic time scale, but on the slower time scale, like uh, uh, like uh, super synoptic or the intra seasonal time scale or seasonal time scale. In fact, in that time scale, SSD indeed can influence the, uh, influence the uh, circulation and it can influence uh, vorticity uh, and circulation. And that can produce a certain forcing in the atmosphere. And that forcing then, therefore, not simply just the SSD convective force but by changing the circulation itself, it can produce vorticity forcing. That vorticity forcing can introduce, uh, again, uh, uh, circulation anomalies that can produce atmospheric breeze. Uh, uh, so uh, sometime back, we had actually identified that on, in, uh, in, in, uh, 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 that on multi decadal time scale, uh, the North Atlantic SST and Indian monsoon rainfall are pretty well correlated. And so, therefore, there is a there in in a, in in addition to the centennial time scale, uh, there is uh, there is a relationship between the uh, the North Atlantic SSD and uh, and and Indian monsoon rainfall on multi decadal time scale. Uh, now. Even on interannual time scale, that there is a relationship, and that relationship has been recently studied by um, uh, one example of such relationship is the study by Bura et al., where they looked at. Uh, all non and so drought year drought years of uh, of indian monsoon and when you do composite of all the sea surface temperature anomalies of non and so el nino drought years and el nino drought years these are el nino drought years and non el nino drought years el nino that is of course el nino signal is very strong north atlantic sst is very weak but on el, uh, uh, non el nino drought years the north atlantic has a very strong cooling very significant cooling, and there is no SST signal in the tropics. There is no El Nino signal. In, in nowhere there is a, a major signal. So, uh, so, so, so the uh, tropics is in the transition from between El Nino and La Nina, and there is no signal. And only signal that is there of SST is in the extra tropics. In the so there is uh, there is clear uh, indication that SST in the extra tropics. May have influenced the, uh, the, the, the non, uh, non uh, the drought years in that uh, in, in the monsoon. And how did they do that? So they they, they looked at uh, they looked at found out 
that uh, if you do composite of these uh, 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 on seasonal mean time scales uh, of the wind anomalies associated with uh, uh, these these events, uh, uh, the, you find that it is there is a strong teleconnection through uh, a, 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 a wave train, a stationary wave train, which uh, um, uh, goes all around the world, including coming over India. And this is a barotropic wave train, which is sitting on the top of this SST. It starts over the North Atlantic and then produces a stationary structure around the globe. And, uh, and that influences the circulation over Indian, in Indian region. Uh, and, and that circulation then affects the rainfall, uh, rain, uh, modulates the rainfall over uh, monsoon region. So therefore, this is the teleconnection. Teleconnection is the wave train, which has been initiated by a barotropic vorticity over the uh, over the uh, North Atlantic, and this barotropic vorticity happens to have uh, ha uh, happen to uh, happens on on on, on interseasonal time scale. They are episodic. They last for about three weeks, and then then um, then die, and then again produce another one event. And in the season, if there is a, uh, there are two events, it really produces a major. Uh, a major structure like this, and that uh, is essentially what influences monsoon. So we have found that the, exactly the same same uh, Rossby wave train also influence on the multi-decadal time scale. So we did we did a, a sort of regression of this uh, SST. Uh, 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 multi decadal component of monsoon uh, on the winds and geopotential height, and it shows exactly the same kind of Rossby wave, uh, stationary Rossby wave, which influence, uh, and that uh, that part is amplified here in this region to show this same kind of Rossby waves which affects uh, the circulation over, uh, over our region, and that influences the monsoon. This is quite different from the ENSO kind of teleconnection on the internal time scale where. The wave train is in the meridional direction. Propagation direction is sort of meridional, but here this is kind of a zonal zonal waves itself. But there is an extension of that wave towards subtropics, which influences our region. So this is the difference between, and, uh, and this is this is now sort of uh, it's pretty well uh, documented now. <clears throat> so so that is clear. But the question is uh, uh, now how does that actually affect the monsoon rainfall? It turns out that uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, as I said, uh, this, this, this uh, Rossby waves or the barotropic vorticity over that uh, uh, SST region is, is is episodic of interseasonal time scale, and that interseasonal time scale uh, it sets up uh, this uh, stationary wave, modulates the stationary waves on the interseasonal time scale, and that interseasonal uh, modulation essentially. And modulates uh, the uh, the interseasonal activity over the monsoon region, and it sort of uh, uh, <coughs> sort of uh, 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 what you call phase locks these mon monsoon active and break spells uh, 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 long active and break spells are phase locked with the uh, seasonal cycle. And that phase locking, in the case of positive AMO, gives rise to positive uh, active spells, and uh, and they are very much associated with the vorticity. Indeed, this is the vorticity uh, 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 activity in the in the in the North Atlantic, uh, barotropic vorticity. So this barotropic vorticity seems to drive these uh, these uh, active spells. Uh, and same thing happens in the opposite thing happens in the AMO negative phase. So this is based on several about 20 years of data. On interseasonal time scale, they always seem to every time when there is a positive thing, they tend to phase lock uh, uh, the active spells uh, during a uh, during a part of the seasonal cycle, and therefore, even when you do composite, uh, the active spells uh, seem to be uh, is, are there uh, uh, or break spells are there. So therefore, the uh, the uh, circulation modulates in such a way to uh, to uh, to phase lock the uh, long active or break spells. Uh, uh, in, and thereby affect the seasonal mean. So therefore, uh, the mechanism is now is essentially happens through interseasonal uh, inter time scale. Uh, the this, uh, the uh, the sum together of these interseasonal activity gives rise to even on this uh, on the on the on the stationary wave. Uh, 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 the interseasonal time scale, the stationary structure is same as the seasonal structure because uh, the the sum of these give rise to that and. Some of the seasonal structure is same as the 
is the, as the as the multi ticketal structure because some together of that seasonal structure actually results in the multi ticketal structure. So therefore, it's the same mechanism which affects from the intra-seasonal time scale all the way to the multi ticketal time scale. So that is the uh, the mechanism that we know. But still, there is one big question about how the vorticity. Uh, uh, how the uh, peripatric vorticity is produced by the SST? Do the SST really drive the peripatric vorticity? So that question was not not very clear. So what uh, to do that? We did certain need like analysis of uh, SST and peripatric vorticity in 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 over this uh, all the all the grid points in the northern <coughs> uh, northern hemisphere and. Uh, and uh, and we did for that we, we removed the uh, 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 synoptic variability by doing weekly data rather than daily data or filtering it just weekly data and if you do that and do a lead lag uh, relationship it turns out that the maximum correlation it happens one one uh, one week uh, one week after the SST uh, so FSST leads the uh, vorticity. And of course, there is a negative correlation, but that it happens over in uh, uh, North Atlantic as well as over North Pacific. These two things are uh, both are part of the same system. Uh, um, AMO is associated with positive anomaly here, also positive uh, positive anomaly here in this region. So, or negative anomaly here, or negative anomaly there in this region. So, therefore, these two are connected, and this indicates that SST could do this. But still, this is 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 still the linear correlation analysis. So still the cause and effect was not very clear now cause and effect uh, 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 it is not clear because um, uh, uh, because uh, uh, this these are basically linear but most of the functional relationships are non linear because the time scales are different right so one is on internal time scale one is on multi digital time scale uh, and then 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 some intersectional to multi digital there are different time scales so this so therefore the relationships are actually non linear so how do we establish that so, um, and also the con conditional independence of these drivers have not been established. So therefore, what we did is, 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 is we, start, we, we, we decided to calculate uh, the causal connection between uh, ISMR and, and so as well as in the presence of the other drivers. Uh, so, so what this can be done today with a different uh, uh, techniques are available, Ranger causality, and uh, this has been used in AI and ML. Uh, yeah. Uh, field a lot, but but here there is another one, something called PCMCI method, which is also very popular today. And uh, and there is I cannot go into the details of that, but we use this PCMCI plus method, which in, in uh, and 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 uh, calculated a, a sort of this involves this methodology involves this uh, uh, this uh, 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 this lead leg relationship or the lead leg regression, but. Uh, uh, but also, he is it, it, it uses the nonlinear dependence between them. So, and then uses a large number of ensemble to find probability, uh, a probability of which direction connection, which lead lag is is correct, and which lead lag has the higher probability, and then establishes a statistical significant association, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 um, directional association uh, with the with the driver. So, what we did is that we. We looked at uh, all these at uh, five different potential or six different potential drivers uh, and use this PCMCI method to uh, see if, uh, find all the possible connections between them and see which one is uh, which one is actually uh, driving which one. So with that leads to something very very interesting, and we find that so this what it means is that so this uh, so whenever there is this uh, no directionality so that means that this. There is uh, uh, there is a, a simultaneous lead lag relationship. So this the, the straight lines are simultaneous relationship, but this uh, uh, the curved lines means there are uh, uh, lag relationship. So so that means this is a positive and the color uh, represents positive uh, or negative correlation. So this is a positive correlation with a lag of uh, of, of a positive uh, connection with a lag of three months. So IOD is it can drive and so. With a, 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 a with a lag of three months. On the other hand, ENSO has a direct connection with uh, uh, with a simultaneous connection, which we know. Uh, ENSO is, has a negative connection with IM. Um, but I am uh, ISMR can also influence the ENSO with a lag of uh, lag of one month. Okay. But most interesting thing that we find 
is that so when this there is no directionality that means we are the method cannot find out from the data we cannot really have a clear idea of who 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 is affecting whom this is called confounded uh, relationship so the, uh, uh, so therefore the simultaneous connection between iod and uh, nino is is not clear which one which one is affecting whom but uh, but iod seem to have an influence on uh, and nino uh, on the other hand I think the most clear signal that has come out is also that AMO is a definite driver of uh, of, uh, of ISMR um, with, a, with a lag of about three months. Okay, uh, uh, in Atlantic, you know, we have found associations ISMR, but we cannot find a clear a clear directionality in that uh, in that uh, connection. IOD also has an association with monsoon, and people say that IOD can drive, but unfortunately, that connection is not very clear. Uh, and we have done with different data sets and, and looked at, and this is, there is a potential and some data set uh, 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 do show that there is a weak connection between uh, IOD driving ISMR, but uh, with small changes in the data set and all that, this does not uh, appear again. So therefore, this seems that there is a possibility of IOD influencing ISMR, but it is a weak connection. The weak connections sometimes uh, are not very, uh, um, very stable. Uh, uh, so, so I think one thing that comes out very clearly is that both AMO and NINO are two uh, two uh, 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 two drivers of ISMR, but the other drivers are not very 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 clear, and they may not be independent of independent of uh, El Nino. But AMO appears to be independent of El, uh, uh, El Nino, um, and so and still a driver. So I think this is a new and new understanding that we, that has emerged from uh, from this uh, uh, this analysis. So uh, uh, going going a little deeper. How does this mechanism of how does this uh, um, uh, on how does it work on the interstitial time scale? Does do the North Atlantic SST produce the barotropic vorticity over there, and do that barotropic vorticity affect the upper level vorticity over the North in the, North in the, uh, over the Indian region? And that upper level vorticity does it affect the, uh, is connected to the lower level vorticity and rainfall over region? So to do that. We had uh, we had used uh, this North Atlantic. It is on intracellular uh, time scale. So these are the, the data which is filtered on intracellular five-day running mean averages of data, and uh, and use that data uh, on intracellular time scale, and use a long data of that, and and, and do all these statistical calculations, uh, uh, probabilities of uh, of connection. And it turns out something very robust connection comes out as North Atlantic SST is indeed drive these, which is consistent with our correlation, the barotropic vorticity over that region. Uh, uh, and, and North Atlantic SST has a direct connection with ISMR interstitial variability. Uh, uh, but that connection happens through these, uh, these barotropic vorticity affecting the upper level vorticity over the North Indian, Indian region. That upper level vorticity is strongly linked to the lower level vorticity that modulates the lower level vorticity. And lower level vorticity, of course, is related to our, uh, our rainfall. So it is not, so one possibility, some argument, reverse argument can be that, uh, uh, okay, if monsoon is, uh, is fluctuating on intracellular time uh, timescale, obviously that will have a lower level vorticity connection uh, associated with this. Uh, and that lower level vorticity will have a divergence, upper level vorticity will be associated with it. But, uh, but this data shows clearly that on, uh, the, it is the modulation of this uh, upper level vorticity is affecting lower level vorticity, not the other way around. Or, or not the ISMR is not affecting the lower level vorticity. It is the lower level vorticity that is affecting the ISMR. So this is clearly shows that external foreseeing are... Sorry, uh, uh, okay, okay, I am done, I am done, almost done, I am done, okay. So, so with that, I think uh, a new knowledge has been, uh, I think, established. I think uh, this is uh, something important. Uh, but uh, I'll just con conclude with the future direction. I was almost uh, uh, to the end. Uh, so basically, I think uh, it, it is important that uh, the establishment of this, uh, 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 the connection with the North Atlantic is now, I think, uh, pretty well settled in the sense that. So therefore, we must try to include that uh, the North Atlantic uh, uh, forcing in the in the, in the in the prediction models. Uh, in other words, models must be able to capture those variability in the North Atlantic to improve the ISMR prediction. And in addition to that, I think we need to do in terms of prediction 
we need to um, need to look at potential scale at long lead prediction because these indicate that uh, there should be long lead uh, long lead uh, predictability but today there is no 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 um, uh, no estimate of long lead predictability. And uh, what is the prediction skill after tw 12 months or 24 months? Uh, we really don't have a, a handle on that. So recently we did some work on that and uh, uh, and, and we estimated that actually uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, monsoon, Indian monsoon has uh, uh, a pretty high predictability even at uh, 18 to 24 months. And this is something something that is work, uh, I am not presenting here, but uh, it is a work that is uh, uh, under review. So I think uh, uh, with that, I'll stop. And if there is time, I will be happy to uh, 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 answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Goswami, for that very inspiring and uh, exciting lecture. And it is, in fact, uh, great that uh, you have actually opened new doors uh, to attack the unmet potential of the, uh, the, the potential predictability of the, the monsoon. I think it is quite optimistic. Uh, so I think we have already uh, quite delayed, but uh, if there is any question, I think we can take one question if anyone wants to uh, take the floor. Okay, I see no request for the floor. So once again, okay. thank you very much, okay. Dr. Goswami. Okay. So thank we'll you so much. On. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. you. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to the last but not the least uh, item of today's session. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Sanjay Srivastava, uh, who is the Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction Program at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific generally known as UNSCAP. So he has been closely associated with uh, the South Asian Climate Outlook Forum and we have been closely working with him. So he will come back to us with uh, uh, the impact-based forecasting uh, angle of uh, monsoon prediction. So he will tell us how the monsoon outlook uh, can be taken to uh, impact forecasting uh, scenario. Uh, Dr. Shivasta, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rupkumarji. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, let me try if I could able to share from my side. Otherwise, I will request uh, uh, my colleague to, to manage from your side. So uh, I think there is some problem. So you can share from your side, Dr. Rupkumarji. You can share the slide. Yes, uh, 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 this is I. It's a honor and privilege to talk to some of the domain expert of the monsoon, and I'm just taking you to some a different tracks. Different track in the sense that you know in WMO there is there is a paradigm that what weather will be to what weather will do. So similarly, if you take that paradigm paradigm in case of Asian monsoon, what monsoon will be to what monsoon will do, how it will impact economy, how it will impact the most vulnerable. So there's that story, the narrative which I'm going to share with you uh, is from a professional of uh, United Nat Nation Regional Economic Commission. So it will give you some economic sense uh, of monsoon, particularly the understanding of the monsoon and the monsoon predictions. So this is a narrative on the impact and policy based on the monsoon, uh, based on the monsoon seasonal forecast of the monsoon. So my next slide is going to tell you the, uh, before you make any forecast, my colleague, uh, Mah Dr. Mahapatra has dealt at length, uh, you need to have a understanding of the risk and impact uh, a priori. The understanding of risk escape, that's the landscape of risk in Asia Pacific. If you convert this in terms of the money, monetize the risk, what is going to be seen is the Asia Pacific region loses $675 billion per year 
this is annualized average loss. Out of this is the 2.4 percent of Asia Pacific gross domestic product GDP. This is the growth engine of the world, and 2.4 percent losses is quite substantial. Quite substantial, not sustainable. It's not good for uh, achieving sustainable development goals in days to come. But when you do a diagnostic analysis, where the risk, where these losses are coming from. We did this analysis and we found that 85% of this 675 billion losses are coming from the climate related disaster, climate related hazards, out of which, surprisingly, 60% comes from drought alone, which is direct, indirect losses of drought across the multiple sectors which impact the drought. So 60% drought. Uh, 12, 13% tropical cyclone, 12, 13% floods, and only uh, 13 to 14% earthquake and tsunami. So if you see the risk escape in the region, the why, how the Asia Pacific region is losing in terms of the money, it's 85% comes from climate related disasters. That is drought, tropical cyclone and floods. If I come to my next slides, our next analysis shows uh, why monsoon is so important. Because basically the monsoon is a risk driver. And when you see the 85% of the climate risk of Asia Pacific, this is over the time, it is from June to October. This is the month where there are largest losses coming from the climate risk profile. And that is the time of the monsoon, Asian monsoon. So most of the seasonal forecast that captures this uh, Asian monsoon temporal profile, profile. So you see, for example, the probability of the risk of the floods, it which peaks from August to September down the line to the October. Whereas in case of uh, uh, the, the drought, you see the other. Thing. So what happens is if you convert this seasonal forecast the time domain to the impact forecast so overlay seasonal forecast to the exposure of the economy people the vulnerable context you can simulate what could be the impact of monsoon this year in asia and pacific so my next slide is going to tell you uh, the impact story this is a methodology that we developed this is a WMO Climate Services. I'm happy Dr. Kumar Kohli is uh, here. He has been the champion of uh, the, 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 the framework of the climate services, which uh, I think now in a operationalized in many ways and also in Asia Pacific region. So we have operationalized this. We have used this hazard information from the monsoon forecast, especially the seasonal forecast, hazard information in terms of all climate related risk. Then we have intersected this in terms of the exposure to the population and some of the critical sector, which is in the framework of climate services like agriculture, energy, health, and disaster management. And then brought it down to the identified the people who are most at risk, risk hotspots, and the potential impact on the economy. So this is the impact-based forecasting framework, which we are following it up with WMO in many countries. So my next slide is going to tell you that uh, uh, if you click uh, the bottom, uh, this is the WMO seasonal outlook of 2021, uh, June, July, August. So this seasonal outlook, how we convert in form of the impact outlook. So if you click the next one, uh, yes, the, you see before you you translate this um, seasonal outlook, you have to see your hot spot of drought and flood in Asia Pacific regions. So left hand side, it indicates the hot spot of drought, floods, and also the vegetation condition during the period when you are making the forecast. And then you look at all three in conjunction, overlay over each other. So whether in a hot spot of the floods where there is going to be a deficit rainfall or hot spot of drought, there is going to be a surplus rainfall, which decides, which gives you a clue how 
would be a impact outlook in times to come, particularly for flood and drought. The next slide is to show you, uh, uh, yes, the next slide is when you over intersect this monsoon, Asian monsoon forecast, what is very clearly we have used the gridded uh, world pop data. It is a very standard uh, gridded information which uh, UN DESA has produced. The population worldwide is in a digital form. And then you intersect seasonal forecast. You see 40 to 60 below normal rainfall. There are 670 million people. And where those people are located, it is indicated in the circuit. When 60 plus above 78 million people, where they are located, is indicated. And same, those who are above below normal. So people who are likely to be affected by floods and drought is indicated. So this is this gives you uh, a clue, a early warning for the early action. The people who are likely to be impacted by this monsoon floods or drought, where they are, what could be the possible risk hotspot. The next slide is to show you uh, the most vulnerable. This is the thanks to our UNDP. They have developed a gridded uh, database for HDI, Human Development Index, and you use the most vulnerable people. Nowadays, we call it multi-dimensional poverty, where the most vulnerable people are located and how they are going to be impacted by floods and drought during this monsoon season. So you locate, you identify, it is spotlighted, the most vulnerable, which will have, which, will, which is going to experience drought in the season or flood in the season. So you narrow it down, identify the hotspot. The next slide is to show to you the some of the energy sources, the power plant, hydroelectric power plant. Before coming to this, you must know power, hydropower in certain country context is key for energy security. For example, in Myanmar, 56% of the energy comes from hydropower. Same is Vietnam, Cambodia. So in Nepal, it is more than 90%. So if you take the the, in the, the contribution of the energy in a particular country's power sector, it's a very important to develop the impact forecasting. So my next slide is going to show to you uh, the agriculture, which is of course, monsoon drives the agriculture systems, but especially in the Asia. So when you see which part of the, the season, there is a likely, impact of the flood and drought on the agriculture system. And then you look at agriculture from its critical ro role in the economy of a respective country. For example, in India, it's like a rice expert, the global value chain in India contributes 33%. Same, Thailand contributes 19%, Vietnam 12%. So the lack of flood or drought during the monsoon period is going to impact the global supply chain of the food system. And that's a very important uh, information for the policy, the impact and policy dynamics. The next slide is uh, going to tell you uh, how this information is disseminated for. This information is to come to the, from a research to the analysis, to the public, to the public policy arena. We used many of the existing platform. Uh, Dr. Rup Kumar is aware of some of this. Uh, the regional climate outlook forums, we used uh, convert the seasonal forecast to the impact outlook, disseminate it to regional climate outlook forum. You do, there are many regional climate outlook forums in Asia, Asia and Pacific region. In many countries, UNSCAF has funded monsoon forums and through rhymes, we reach down the line at the monsoon forum and then develop the adaptation tool. So it's a outlook to impact, to preparedness plan and to monitoring. This is how you can manage the risk of the monsoon system, monsoon season in times to come. My next slide is going to tell you some very specific what we did in South Asia Climate Outlook Forum. So this is a two SASCOF South Asia Climate Outlook Forum. And this was converted from a seasonal outlook to, uh, to impact out, impact forecasting. So next slide 
we tell you some of the impact forecasting product. Of course, I, I, I don't want to give a tall claim, but what was surprise for all of us was in 2021, when we used the seasonal forecast SASCOF data, three months, I think it was sometime in month of April. And then we brought this uh, impact uh, forecast and then some of the forecast, for example, in August, September, Pakistan was severely hit by heavy rains and experienced urban floodings, 400 life lost. It was indicated very well in advance. So many of the hot spots, which were indicated very well in advance, were found, happened in due course of the time. So uh, it a probabilistic forecast has its own limitations. All of you are aware of it, but it gives you some kind of a a directional, a, a, what we call in the language of the early warning system, early warning to early action. So it narrows down your target area of the response. And that's where the monsoon forecast impact makes a lot of sense in terms of impact and policies. The next slide is to tell you that to operationalize the climate services and particularly the monsoon uh, impact forecasting, we have uh, develop a risk and resilience portal. All the data that I shared with you, because it's an era of digitalization, uh, included the graded world pop data, all infrastructure layer. UNSCAP is a custodian of all energy, the transport, all uh, infrastructure layer. So all the digital databases are here. So you can make use of it. What Dr. Mahapatra, my friends, told, uh, these are the digital data. It can be used for impact forecasting at a broad level, not micro, but macro level in Asian regions. So I think this was my last slide. And thank you once again for giving this opportunity. It's important to take science into the policy domain, and this is an effort to take it to the policy domain. So thank you, Dr. Rupur. Thank you very thank much. You, uh, Dr. Srivastava for that uh, very encouraging presentation. And in fact, uh, what some of your statements are music to my ears, because we always have uh, this kind of uh, uh, concern that seasonally aggregated information may not be of uh, uh, much use in decision making, but you have clearly uh, demonstrated how even seasonally aggregated outlooks can be taken forward and actually uh, converted into impact specific uh, uh, decisions. Uh, that is that is really very encouraging, and and I, I hope you will continue your uh, support to the climate outlook forums uh, and help us understand the uh, user needs uh, and and uh, try to improve the way we generate our forecast and make them more reliable and more uh, detailed in terms of space time resolutions. Uh, so. Uh, so before we close the session, if there are any uh, questions to Dr. Shivastav, I think maybe we can take one question. Ashrit, you want to uh, ask something? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> that was a nice talk, uh, Dr. Shivastav. I just was wondering with uh, one of the graphic, which was very interesting, which indicated that floods uh, seem to be have very swift impact and there is only time to respond. There is no actually no time to prepare. While the impact of droughts seem to be like they build over a time. So that gives an impression that there is possibility, there is scope for uh, preparation through early warning and impact based forecasting, things like that. How can we prepare and make use of uh, the forecast for uh, preparing for the drought if you have some vision on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raghavendra. There are excellent, I think NCMRF is, a, is a, one of the frontiers in this area. Uh, uh, what our perspective, particularly from the UN side was, unless you convert your forecast into the impact, uh, you, you heard Dr. Mahapatra but in India context. I'm talking about Asia Pacific region. We bring out uh, World Bank, ADB, UNSCAP, economic outlook. So in economic outlook, we are using the arc of data, the, the seasonal uh, Dr. Rup Kumar what she was highlighting. Uh, suppose if this monsoon season in South uh, Asia, where there are agrarian economies and uh, more than 20% of the GDPs of South Asia depends on agriculture. If there are shortfall in, let us say, if there are more likely floods or drought, 
to what extent it is going to impact the economy. So we bring out uh, a kind of a economic outlook and we are integrating nowadays SASCOF into our economic outlook. So in a country, uh, for example, if I am talking from a UN perspective, a country which has to take decision on the import or export of the food grains, uh, there are countries who are likely to be deficit and those are all the poor countries. So what could be the trade regime? What could be liberalization of the trade? to support the most vulnerable in the country. So those are the policy area. And in case of drought, suppose I must share with you some of the examples in Vietnam, there was a uh, foresightedness, there was a mean, say, outlook about a drought and the country could able to prepare well in advance. Uh, you rightly said for flood and tropical cyclone response time is very limited. For drought response time is uh, substantially, is, is, is considerable in terms of preparing the country and response agency. So this is happening. That is where you need impact based forecasting and target those people who are likely to be impacted by drought. That's the reason I specifically pin down human development index, HDI, the, the graded data and you just pin down these are the people who will be impacted by the drought so all your drought related interventions to protect the vulnerable and poor uh, should be risk informed and it should be known well in advance right thank you i think that that is a good point to uh, end this uh, very very interesting session uh, in fact, this actually uh, sets the scene for, for the entire workshop. Uh, so uh, I, we had uh, six uh, really uh, high quality presentations from eminent personalities. I think uh, uh, I, uh, we had uh, a lot of information on the regional monsoons and also the impact aspects. Uh, so this is uh, 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 a, a great beginning for the international workshop on the monsoons. And once again, I thank all the speakers for, uh, uh, for, the, for their presentations and also some of our colleagues from, from the Americas uh, for staying up very late in the night and, and uh, uh, making their presentation. This is uh, very encouraging. So, uh, and with that, I also thank the International Scientific Committee for giving me this opportunity of sharing this session. And now I give the floor to the organizers for their housekeeping announcements. Thank you very much, sir, actually, for uh, nicely chairing the session. And this is a good beginning, actually, in the morning, our local morning, in fact, we are thinking how this third day will proceed. So everything went well. So I think it was a very good beginning. And tomorrow we'll have a formal uh, inauguration also, where the Secretary General uh, recorded message is there. Our secretary will be there, and uh, there are many eminent people are there. And then also there are some um, function like IMS will provide the present the Gilbert Rocker. All these things are pending tomorrow, and also many scientific sessions are there lined up. So we, I think with that uh, we'll close this first day of the session. And uh, thank you to you as well as all the speakers and our the panelists who. That like Professor C. P. Chang and Dr. Ajit Tyagi sir, Mahapatra sir also gave the formal welcome address. So thank you very much, sir. With this, we will just closing our first day of the. You can just visit our website for any uh, further update or anything that is for tomorrow onwards. Thank you very much. Namaskar.